There we go. Hey, good to see you, Eva. So you want to make me a, a host? Oh, yes. And then I'm going to share my screen. Just make sure captions on. Okay. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Are you all ready? Good to see George and Joseph, our public members. I see Adam is coming on. And Dan's a host. Yes. And you guys are all set? Yeah, I guess. Um, are you set, Dan? Yeah. Yeah, I think I am. I think I got it. <laughs> okay. Oh, great. Good okay, meeting. So let's see who's here. We don't have too much of our committee on yet. We we need our, uh, our quorum. So I think it's only um, you. Then me, Adam, George, and Joe, Playhaven. So I am wondering where the rest of our committee is. Let's... Uh, I, I could start calling the attendance, but I think we want our guests to know about that. Let's see what the chat is telling us. Uh, oh, great. We've got all, thank you, Adam. Adam has gotten all our meeting protocol. On and Dan's got it is in the chat, and Dan's got it on the screen as well. So this is a great beginning, and let's see our participants. We've got fourteen attendees. Thank you all for coming. I'm just looking at our names here, uh, I see that uh, our, some of our, our presenters are already here for both our items. But we're simply waiting for more committee people to come to get our quorum. And I'm wondering what's happening with them. So, you know, Dan, in the meantime, we can certainly um, elevate um, Matt Vigiano. And uh, let's see who else is here. Okay, uh, Jeffrey just... LeFrancois, I think, is here. I'm ready to come on it, yeah. Yeah, actually, Matt, Matt, you can wait a while because you're number two on the agenda, but we need Jeffrey, and I guess if Evan... I is... got two, uh, Jeff, let's make another Jeffrey. Jeffrey's hey, on. Evan's here. Oh, Jeffrey's here. Okay. Is that you, Jeffrey? Uh, Jeffrey's about to come on. Evan's reads already here. Oh, okay. Right. Is that Evan? I, can you see me? I, I feel like my camera's on and all of that. You know what? The thing is, is we didn't, your name isn't on. I'm amazed. Oh, I have. I see my name here. But anyway, hi. Mm -hmm. But that's you, Evan. Okay. Evan, is anybody else joining in the He's, I'm, I'm here, Jeffrey's Shirley. Here. It's Jeffrey. Okay. So it's Jeffrey and Evan. Good. Now, what we have to do... Let me just see, let me, while I'm waiting for all our committee members to come on. Janet just got here. And, uh, and Lo Lois is here. Who? Lois. So oh, Lois, Lois did come after all. I just I you thought down. I was going to be excused, but I couldn't get there. It was too late to go. Oh, so I'm okay. happy to be here. Well, we, I see we have some folks from community board too that are uh, attending our guests tonight, which are Donna Raftery and Frederica Siegel. And um, let's see who else. Uh, Donna, I'm getting now. Oh, I see that Tevin, Tevin Williams, thank you for coming, representing Senator Hoyleman. And I saw that Nicole Barth is here representing council member Botcher. So welcome to you guys. And I hope I'm not not recognizing somebody I know, you know, who's, uh, okay, let me just see who our panelists are. So we've got, uh, from, okay, Janet's here and let's see who else. I still don't think we have enough committee members. Let's see, one, two, three, four, uh, five, six, seven, you know what? We have enough. So I think I'm going to start. And when people join, oh, golly, wait a minute now. 
Um, I just screwed up. Okay, can you hear me still? Yeah. Oh, okay, good. Because I, I screwed yes. up for a minute. I, I switched to the wrong place. But you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to start introducing everybody and calling attendance and whatnot. So, okay. Welcome to everyone to Community Board 2 Manhattan's Traffic and Transportation Committee meeting. And I am Shirley Secunda, who is the chair. And I'd just like to introduce you to our members of our committee by way of calling the attendance. So everybody kind of raise your hand and say here very loud because maybe I just don't see everybody. So, okay, uh, Natasha Avanesians, not here yet. And Amy Brennan is gonna be a little late, I know that. And how about Ritu Shatri? Are you here yet, Ritu? No, okay. Janet Liff? Janet, I saw your name. Here. Oh, there you go. Hi, <laughs> Janet. Okay. And Dan Miller is I'm here. our host tonight, and he's our vice chair as well. And so I am putting him down. And Anthony Wong. I haven't seen Anthony Wong yet, right? No, this is really odd. And Adam Zeldin. Adam, I know you're here. Yep. Okay. So say it good and loud. So we can, oh, I, you know what it is? We can't see you, I guess. Okay. Yeah, I've been having trouble with my camera today. Apologies, oh, okay. but I'm no, but crystal clear on audio. Loud and clear, Adam. So we got you. And how about George Hycalis? I know here. you're here. Okay, here. George, can we see you at all? This is really interesting. Okay. And Joseph Slayhaven. I know you're here. I saw you before, Joseph. Well, anyhow, I know you're here. So uh, we will see if our other members kind of wander in. But in the meantime, we've got enough for our quorum and enough to start. And so I will just give for those of you who haven't attended or would like a review, what our approach is our, um, and our protocol as well. Um, basically, we've got two items on the agenda tonight. Both items are, are, are going to be, I think, pretty lengthy because of two presentations, which sound really interesting. And um, okay, each of the items is presented separately. First, the committee asks questions. Then we open it up to all our guests so that they too can both ask questions and do comments. Then we go into what we call the business session, which is when we discuss both these items and we talk about what we would like to address most. And in this case, I think in both cases, we'll probably do resolutions. So we will also talk about what we might include in the resolutions. And uh, for those of you who don't know again, I think most of you do, that's not the end because then it goes to full board and our full board meeting this month is early. It's on December 15th. It's a Thursday, again, as the usual meeting. And we'll begin at 6.30. And you can get that information on the CB2 website as to connecting with that meeting if you want to uh, follow through on this. Uh, we do have certain ground rules. For some reason, I have just been cut out. Yeah, very interesting. Anyhow, ground rules. Okay, and the ground rules are here too, um, which basically are uh, raise your hand if you want to comment. Uh, we do limit and always have um, two attendees speaking just once, unless we have plenty of time, which I really don't think we'll have, but everybody will have a chance to speak, but for no more than two minutes. Uh, again, our time is kind of limited tonight, but uh, we will try to hear all of you. I would ask that if uh, any of you seem to have the same thing to say as somebody else, just when we call and you just say, say, I agree with what everybody else has. Oh, Donna is saying the full board meeting has been changed again to Tuesday, December 20th. I haven't seen that, Donna. I thought it was it was made 
Are you sure? I, I think you look, you know what, everybody? Look on the board uh, website to make sure. Uh, yes, Ditto Ray, the meeting says Frederica Siegel and Donna and Frederica are both members of Community Board too. So I guess they've seen the latest and I haven't. So, okay, December 20th. And I've got to make a note of that myself. Uh, December 20th will be the meeting and it's a Tuesday for the full board then. Okay. All right, look, so the rest of our meeting protocol is right in front of you right now. And uh, when we get to our speaker and their presentation, we also have the protocol on the chat. So please confer with the chat. Uh, it's really just a matter of please don't speak out. You won't be able to anyhow because we're really going to have you muted. And we will unmute you when it's ready for you to talk. And um, I think with that, we're just going to go to our first item, which is the uh, Meatpacking Business Improvement District, which is giving an update on their Western Gateway study and uh, vision. And um, this study, I, I just have to tell you, is an ongoing one. And they did give a presentation in May. And we had asked them to come back to kind of give us an update because it sounded like from what their calendar was, they have made some other steps. So without further ado, I'm not gonna speak anymore. I think you'll be happy to know. And is it Jeffrey or is it Evan that's going to be doing the presentation? I'm gonna do the, the presentation and then probably during Q and A, Evan and I will uh, sort of play ping pong as that happens, depending on the questions, Shirley. Oh, okay, great, Jeffrey. So it's Jeffrey LeFrancois, who's the executive director of the meatpacking bid. And then will be Evan Sweet. And oh, golly, Evan, can you tell me what your title is? <laughs> so I'm the director of neighborhood planning. Right, okay, great. And, and Evan will help Jeffrey out. So without further ado, Jeffrey, Great. I guess you want to get the screen, screen shared and yep. so on. I will certainly do that. And I checked, I have permission. So Madam yep. Chair, thank you. Um, Daniel, Donna, Frederica, many others on the committee. Nice to see you all. Um, we're really excited to be here tonight presenting to you um, the product of the work really of the past year. When we came to you in May to talk about our Western Gateway um, vision plan and study, it was to solicit feedback and input. And so we spent a lot of time doing that. And what I'm sharing with you today is like the, is the result of all of that work. So this is this study, uh, which we partnered with WXY um, Architecture and Urban Design, as well as Sam Swartz Engineering, um, is a real reflection of a part of the neighborhood um, that really just hasn't been looked at in a long time. Um, it has often sort of been, become, it's very much become a back of house um, part of the district, and yet things have changed tremendously. The Whitney Museum is now home on Gansevoort Street for over seven years. Um, we've seen a whole bunch of change in uses in the neighborhood. Obviously, this is a key picture because the meatpacking plant is there, uh, but there's a whole bunch of other stuff happening around it. And really, this is largely a remnant of kind of when, you know, that the 9A, as we know it today, was put in uh, in the late 80s, early 90s. And of course, our plan here is a reaction to the great success that we've seen um, from the plazas that were made permanent um, in the Gansevoort 9th Avenue redesign, which you know run from Gansevoort Street up 9th Avenue to 15th Street. And so our thinking is how do we extend that smart planning, that smart streetscape, that prioritization for people to other corners of the district, given how the uses of the neighborhood have changed significantly, not just in the past decade, but really the past couple of decades as well. And of course, as many of you are aware, because you were all part of the planning process for all of these, right on our Western edge, amazing things are happening in the Hudson River. Uh, Pier 57 um, opened earlier this year with a rooftop park. Um, we've got Little Island, which you all know well, opened a year and a half ago. And then soon to come, something we're very excited about, Gansevoort Peninsula will also be opening. Three fabulous amenities now right on the edge of the bid boundaries, drawing a tremendous amount of attention um, and foot traffic to the neighborhood. So when we thought about this, we obviously had to define an area and we're calling it our Western Gateway. And so what you see here in, in the solid white line is the scope area of the study that we're gonna take you through tonight. And the bid boundaries are the dotted white line. So Horatio Street is our Southern boundary, 17th Street to the North 
8th Avenue on, the, on our eastern flank um, and the Hudson River um, to the west. So, you know, the reason we didn't just work with an architecture firm, but we also had to bring in, you know, an engineering and, and traffic study firm is because there's a whole lot that happens day in and day out in the meatpacking district. At our core, we are a business district, sort of buffered and surrounded um, by a residential community, which are in the bid boundaries and also outside of them. And obviously, it wasn't just about the business, but about the quality of life for everybody in the neighborhood, thinking about safety, um, vehicle access for, for a freight, for freight purposes, um, for taxi pickup and drop off, private vehicles, um, all super important. Um, connectivity, not just uh, sort of connecting A to B, but how do folks get here, whether it's public transit, their own car, a taxi, micro mobility, how should we be thinking about those things? And then what is the use of the curb? How is that um, work or not work as it relates to the state of the district today? So as I mentioned, um, CB2 was a stakeholder on our, our engagement outreach back um, in May. Um, and we talked to a whole bunch of others, board four as well, they're in the scope of this study to the north, um, property owners, businesses, um, block associations, um, a whole, you know, a whole bunch of folks in the neighborhood, in and around the neighborhood, adjacent to the project to really get their thoughts and feedback. We also did a, a stakeholder engagement and business survey, um, which, you know, as you can see here, lays out the priorities, high, low, and medium of what those, um, the businesses in the district thought we should be thinking through as it relates to the space outside. So everything from curb space, roadway, public space, delivery, access, all those kinds of things. And as you can see here, where the priorities lie, it's really reflective of the, the nature of the district, which is business. Um, and so that's sort of how it, it, it played out here. This is all stuff that we took you through back in May. So I'm going to sort of move pretty quickly through this because I think there are conditions that you're familiar with. So that way we can get to sort of the meat of things. Um, this is 14th Street looking west from about 9th Avenue. Um, and of course, this picture is taken um, recently. But also, as we know, recently, um, you know, the 14th Street traffic and truck priority way was made permanent. And so that has significantly reduced vehicle volumes on 14th Street from river to river even though the TTP technically ends at 9th Avenue, the segment from 9th to 10th is still, uh, doesn't see the volumes um, that it did before the transit way was put into effect. But of course, we've always found 14th Street to actually struggle from a retail and hospitality standpoint. And it's kind of odd why, given that it's a great through point for the district to step off from the plazas, sort of the plaza core of the neighborhood, making your way to the High Line. Um, and so that's always been a struggle. Washington Street, we consider to be quite idiosyncratic uh, in terms of an avenue in the neighborhood. It's two way for two blocks. There's a whole bunch of different uses here, um, you know, in discussion with the meat market. Their key priority was safety. And I think this picture really shows why their concern is for safety because of the way of the nature of people walking through the neighborhood. And then, of course, sort of the tangle of trucks uh, for their operations. Here, uh, this committee is quite familiar with it, and we're just thrilled about the progress already being made in the area we're calling Gansevoort Landing. But here, um, south of Gansevoort Street on 10th Avenue, just below the Whitney, um, super wide roadway, that plaza is gonna be coming online later next year. Um, this is looking to the north on 10th Avenue, again, behind the Whitney and the meatpacking plant. That's the standard hotel that you can sort of see there. Um, again, sort of a chaotic, underutilized part of the neighborhood. Um, and then this is my favorite and least favorite part of the whole study, um, 14th and 10th and the 9A interchange, uh, an extremely complicated and, and rather hostile intersection, no matter your mode of mobility, vehicle, foot, um, one wheel, two wheels, what have you, it is, it is confusing um, and, and troubling. Um, this, while it's a picture of a truck making this movement, this is the northbound turn from 14th Street onto 10th Avenue. And I know this is board four, but um, sort of contextually speaking, there's two buses um, that make this turn every day, multiple times a day, the 12, M12 um, and the 14D um, make this northbound turn. And then they have to do a sweep across six lanes of 10th Avenue to make the westbound turn onto 15th Street to get to 9A. So a super complicated vehicular move in, in, in a one block um, portion. This is board four, but the, what we refer to as the Chelsea Market blocks, the struggles of the High Line, and then the width of, of 10th Avenue, how that really changes the feel um, and context of the neighborhood 
um, and how we can think about um, making adjustments to that to feel sort of more contextually appropriate. So all those areas I just walked you through, these are our sort of red zone issues um, for focus. Of course, we always see a challenge as an opportunity and that's what this whole study has sort of taught us. So from that, we took and broke out those areas into six individual projects, um, which can be taken as a standalone, each one individually. You, this committee is familiar um, in particular with item three, um, but I'm gonna walk you through um, one through five and we'll sort of not really, six actually isn't much in here and that's out of, out of, out of scope for CB2 to give you the lay of the land. Um, again, I'm gonna speed through these, these here because this is the technical slide of what I just walked through in all those pictures. So 14th Street, um, Washington Street, uh, these are pointing out your challenges and opportunities and some uses on the blocks. The area we refer to as Gansevoort Landing or sort of the foot of get the end of Gansevoort Street or the beginning, depending on how you wanna look at it. Um, the area north of Gansevoort Street behind the Whitney and the Meat Market, uh, the 10th Avenue corridor. Um, this is the 14th Street and 10th Avenue interchange. Um, which as you can see here, these arrows highlight the pedestrian movements. There are crosswalks to nowhere. Um, the, you know, this is a key intersection because a year ago, 30,000 people a week were crossing here. Um, this year, 80,000 people a week are crossing here. So huge volume, huge increase of pedestrian use given what's happening um, you know, in the Hudson River. Um, not just from a visitation standpoint, but you have to think about the offices that now exist at Pier 57. There's city winery, a food hall is going to be going in there, the attractions of Little Island, the whole nine. And then you have the vehicular movements in this intersection, um, all of which are, are complicated and happen in this sort of one triangle tangle of an area that, like I said, very much um, is sort of a remnant um, of the, the implementation of 9A as we know it today. Uh, in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, the Chelsea Market Streets to the north, just thinking about 10th Avenue. And so what this all got us to is to develop six principles through which everything that we're gonna show you next is driven through. Um, priority number one and above all always is about being safe and safety and, and thinking through um, how we can make things safer while also making sure that um, there's access uh, business can function and happen that as, as much as somebody works here, they're enjoying it as much as the person who lives down the block is as well. And that with safety comes an invitation to spend time and enjoy yourself here. Um, that it should be people centered and balanced. Um, because again, as I mentioned, we're, it's a, it's, we're a largely a commercial district surrounded by, of course, wonderful residential communities um, to the north, east and south. Um, when we talk about connectivity and how that should be seamless, it's about mobility, um, moving people from A to B, no matter sort of their, their mode of movement and how we can get to and from the neighborhood. And then, you know, a lot of New York City is, is not necessarily rational nor organized. So how can we begin to think about applying um, rational and organized thought to helping folks get from A to B, to helping business function in a more effective and efficient manner? Um, and then given that it's meatpacking, we care about what things look like here. Um, we have a brand that we feel really good about and so that it's chic and timeless is important. And then um, one of the things that's really important is coordination and innovation. Um, it's almost 2023. And so much of what happens on our streets outside um, happened the same way as if it was the 1950s. And I often question why. And so what can we be doing to think about bringing the neighborhood and logistics and operations um, into the 21st century. And so a lot of what we're, we're, we're gonna take you through here um, begins to plant the seeds for all that type of stuff. So here's, here's the vision. Here's what I like to refer to as meat and the sexy stuff. Um, and again, when I say vision, this is the beginning um, of this process that's going to lead to some of these changes. So I'm gonna walk you through each, each of these um, on the whole. And then as folks have questions, we can go back to other slides um, as necessary, but it's sort of easier to run through it all. So here's the bird's eye view looking west at 14th Street and 9th Avenue today as it exists. Here is the interim proposal of 14th Street um, between 9th and 10th. You'll note that each project um, comes with an interim proposal and what we refer to as a capital proposal. Interim is something that can happen, um, I don't, quickly is, an, is not a, an appropriate term, but sooner 
um, with fewer zeros behind the budget. And then capital is a more long-term investment, think shovels in concrete um, and many more zeros um, in that budget line. And so what this does is it puts a two-way protected bike lane median down, down the center of 14th Street for a couple of reasons. There's no connection to the Manhattan bike network and um, the Greenway in this part of the neighborhood. And when we're thinking about how 14th Street is used today, it's really underutilized as a space. And so by putting this bike connection in there, we're doing two things. We're providing connection for cyclists from the Greenway to the rest of the Manhattan grid in this area, which like I said, doesn't exist. And then number two, we're attempting to bring more of a human scale to the street, which we hope will improve uh, conditions for retail and hospitality along this block, given that it really is um, a prominent thoroughfare in the neighborhood that when you think about what's happening um, on this block and of course, further west. This still allows for all the functions that happen today, your loading pickup and drop off along all the curbs and continued east and westbound traffic for all vehicles um, between 9th and 10th on 14th Street here. The capital plan envisions a bit of a canopy um, and are, you know, and, and really thinking through what that would be like. Um, you'll see that we understand there's a lot of work that goes into putting, putting trees in the ground. And in particular, there's gonna be a lot of utilities on 14th Street, but we didn't wanna not think about how we could green the area as we also make it um, uh, a better space. So, um, Existing condition, this is 14th Street and Washington today, looking sort of Southwest. And then this is the capital rendering, right? So the, the sort of the full fancy expensive build. Um, and you can see a whole bunch of actions happening in this one, one visual. You have that taxi making a southbound turn onto Washington Street. You have the cyclist going two directions. You have space for people to be in the median on 14th Street. You have loading happening down um, sort of in front of Highline Stages, right, which is a, um, a film production and event space on the north side of 14th Street. Um, so showing everything that can happen, even with this, um, you know, going to effect is the goal of this photo. Moving on uh, to Washington Street. Um, here is that picture of the street as it exists today. Um, here is what we are proposing. Um, a key change here is that the proposed, this, this action would make Washington Street all south, excuse me, all southbound off of 14th Street. Today, it is two way from Little West 12th Street up to 14th Street. When we talked to folks that utilize that, um, they didn't really seem to see it as necessary. And when we thought about how that would affect uh, the village to the, to the south, um, it doesn't because Washington Street already flows to the south. So this was about allowing us to turn Washington Street into what we call, and the city calls, a slow street, allowing for the um, constant access of vehicles um, to have them safely mix with an expanded pedestrian footprint. You'll see a lot of that beige taupe color is a repurposing of the curb to bring um, what we would refer to as plaza space to Washington Street, and then pick up, drop off, and loading zones on each block. And this was a key reaction to a lot of our stakeholders saying, well, when are you gonna do stuff on Washington Street a la programming? Um, whether, whether, and when we say programming, I can mean passive programming by saying a table and chair or um, active programming, whether it's you know a, a group of um, musicians on the corner, um, is there a reading happening, a piece of public art, something like that. And so again, a direct reaction to being able to extend those things to other parts of the neighborhood in terms of the, what we've seen in the successes of Ninth Avenue. So again, interim, and then on the Capitol, um, you see permanent expansion of sidewalks, right? Greening and bringing a canopy in where we can. Of course, um, it'll be tricky because thankfully a lot of the buildings on Washington Street still have their awnings, which we love. Those are an amazing um, you know, visual and scale component in the neighborhood. So this, uh, we have to be creative about how we're greening in this area. So this is Washington Street at Little West 12th, looking south today. Um, and this is Washington Little West, Little West 12th. We think it could be in uh, the potentially near future. This is a, an interim view of what that could look like. So as you can see here, um, painted treatments in the street. Um, know that um, that paint in the street is not what we anticipate it being. That is a repurposing of a mural that we did um, in the neighborhood. So our designers just wanted to sort of bring that, that through. 
Um, but you see tables and chairs, um, the bollards that we're all, the, the granite block that we're all familiar with, and then really extending our planting vocabulary throughout the district as well um, to bring greening to more places. So just a real repurposing um, of space that we, we otherwise see as, as largely underutilized today. Um, an area this committee knows well, what we're referred to as Gansvort Landing. Um, I'm going to share this because while we're getting some of this, we are going to, we're trying to go a little further as it relates to uh, what, what our goals are for this area. So you're all familiar with this plaza that we are delighted uh, to be working with the city and TF Cornerstone to make this happen in this spring, summertime. So where the red umbrellas are is what this committee um, and the full board gave unanimous approval to, which is just wonderful, um, just last month. But the key addition here is that um, the installation of a crosswalk at Gansevoort Street across 9A to connect the neighborhood to Gansevoort Peninsula. And we want to do this for a couple of reasons. Um, it shows a good connection um, for the Whitney Museum to Day's End, right, which is the piece of public art um, in the water off of Gansevoort Peninsula. Um, right now, the pedestrian has to traverse a really awkward journey, sort of south almost all the way to Jane Street to get across 9A. The, the, the good part about what this allows for is that there's already a traffic signal at Gansevoort Street on 9A, but there's no crossing. So the, one of the biggest obstacles is a traffic signal. And so that that's already in place, there's real potential for this to happen here. Um, and we, you know, we've talked to our friends at State DOT and sort of reminded them of how difficult it was when Little Island opened without a, a real thought through of, of what the volumes of traffic would be, PEDs would be like going across. And so this is something we are um, hoping uh, everybody is interested in so we can really ratchet it up with the state as Gansvoort Peninsula marches closer um, to opening. So the interim plan um, and then the capital plan, which is pretty significant. Um, and I'll speak through this slide and then it sort of gets to the next two, which is, which is a why. Many of the operations that we considered in this area had to do with the Whitney Museum's um, loading needs. Um, multiple times a year, they bring in um, an 83 foot truck to move some big art uh, to and from the museum. And so all those moves had to be considered when we were thinking about what to do here and access to the Whitney's loading dock um, is, is, was a key factor. Believe it or not, this doesn't negate that. But what this does do is it allows vehicular access to 9A from Gansevoort Street. It adds crossings on both sides of Gansevoort Street. Um, at 9A and also provides for the bike connection in this area. And then it sort of turns the area in front of the museum and in front of the building 95 Horatio, really what we refer to as sort of a front porch on the Hudson uh, by sort of formalizing the green space there, uh, making it plazas, bringing in canopy to really connect um, the Whitney uh, and, and, and meat packing with all the great greenery uh, on the other side um, of the highway. And so this is that existing condition today. Um, Ritu, I think you're on. Of course, you know well the, the donuts and joyriding that takes place in this intersection quite regularly. Um, and this is sort of the capital vision long term of what that might look like if we thought about really um, what a redesign of this area would be. Because like I said, going from back of house to front porch on the Hudson. This area, uh, the 10th Avenue corridor is less about looks and more about logistics. Um, today, it is a two-way operation largely serving the meat market folks who are confused coming off of, the, of 9A in the wrong direction, um, and then Whitney access um, to uh, their loading docks. The, few, the, the, the interim proposal is to make it one way southbound only, to better organize the space behind the meat market there, uh, because they still have a whole bunch of operations with big tractor trailers that do need to happen, but it becomes a parking lot. It becomes another place where folks um, are coming and doing car tricks that not only are illegal, but just that really nobody likes um, and just rationalizes the space. Um, you'll also see in these slides where that the fence is sort of in a design. We're just sort of showing that because today it's a really ugly chain link fence. And how can we begin to think about making that something that that um, looks better than what it does given that half the time it's, it's knocked over and the state doesn't do a good job keeping it in, in proper repair. Another part about this slide that um, isn't shown here, but we'll talk about it in the next one. I don't know if you can see my, um, I have a cross moving in this mouse. This region up here in sort of the top um, left quadrant of the picture um, is a state owned DOT lot. Some folks would be familiar with that. There's a dog run there. Um, it's a 
it was a staging site for construction for a long time and it's a surface parking lot today in a deal made with the state. And we see it as a key uh, logistics um, point for the neighborhood, which this slide, the Capitol build show begins to show. Um, you know, one of the things that is, is challenging in a commercial district is freight and the management of it and the movement of goods. And right now it's done very sloppily, quite frankly. Um, and so how can we think about using that lot as a place for um, micro, micro mobility as a distribution hub for the neighborhood? So have the bigger trucks come unload there onto cargo bikes, hand trucks, et cetera. And then suddenly they are bringing things to stores, your apartment building, et cetera, all from within this, this, this distribution hub. Um, you know, we see Amazon do this in the curb lane right now. And it, it, it's not a space we think that it should be happening. And so we see this as a real asset um, in terms of how we can convince, hopefully convince the state to sort of have us be the partner on this, because not only could it be a hub for logistics, and sort of organization for the neighborhood, but how does it become a public space that's useful when we think about time of day activity in the neighborhood? This also shows the Whitney loading dock, which would then we propose having what um, the engineers refer to as a chute onto 9A northbound um, from the museum. So really the only activity that would be happening here is access to the meat market and access to the Whitney Museum. And so anybody that comes down there is likely doing that. Um, and can get slip right out onto 9A from that area. And so what it does is really just prevent all the, the, the negative stuff that happens, which is folks coming off of 9A, south of Gansevoort Street going the wrong direction, um, a whole bunch of things. So it really just makes square a lot of the intersections that never have been. Um, and again, all about reuse of the space. Um, 14th and 10th and 9A, like I said, my, my um, favorite and least favorite part of this whole study. Um, this shows the operations as they exist today. Um, and this is what we're proposing. Um, to start, it would reduce crossing time for pedestrians to get across every crossing that they might have to navigate here. It makes sure that all of those crossings actually go to somewhere because today they all don't. Um, it turns the off-ramp um, from 9A onto 10th Avenue into a plaza. In our analysis, we found that the majority of the traffic getting off of 9A at this part of 10th Avenue, we're using it to go to the Lincoln Tunnel. And if we know where the Lincoln Tunnel is, it's certainly not at 14th Street or even in the vicinity of 14th Street. And um, rationally speaking, and from like a volume perspective, keeping that on the highway makes a lot of sense. And then it also allows us locally to make safer the intersection, um, clean up the actions so that things are very specific this allows for eastbound traffic on 14th Street, and then also the southbound connection onto 10th Avenue, um, you know, to go below sort of the meat market. What this doesn't allow for is exit onto 14th Street to go north on 10th Avenue. Um, if you wanted to get a northern part on 10th Avenue, like any other block in the city, you would go up to 16th Street or 18th Street and sort of find your way onto 10th. But this preserves vehicular access all across 14th Street, and then allows for the southbound loop on 10th. Um, it begins to clean up what we see as a very sloppy um, treatment of the bike um, of the bike infrastructure in the area. Uh, DOT presented to CB4 recently its plans for a protected bike lane on 10th Avenue. This proposes um, uh, a protected bike lane on the south side of 15th Street, and then a bike lane of what we would refer to as the middle of 10th Avenue today, but really it's not the middle of 10th Avenue because we've reduced um, the vehicle lanes from between 14th and 15th to two lanes. So now those buses and trucks, when they make that northbound turn, they're only, they only have to go over one lane to then go west on 15th Street, as opposed to doing um, you know, a Jersey sweep to clear um, you know, six lanes uh, in one block. The capital plan goes a little bit further. Um, it proposes a two-way protected bike lane on 15th Street and then down and up 10th Avenue between 14th and 15th. We thought it made a lot of sense to concentrate cycle traffic on 15th Street because of the volume of pedestrian traffic at 14th Street. And given that 14th actually is a more complicated intersection, focusing the cyclists on 6th, 15th um, just felt more rational. Um, and so this allows for that north and southbound connection to connect ideally to that 14th Street protected bike lane that we wanna put down the median. And then as well to the northbound um, 10th Avenue bike lane as well. 
Um, it expands, um, you know, those 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 bulb outs and daylighting to make shorter the times that pedestrians would need to cross um, 10th Avenue and to cross 9A. And of course, in some manner or another, it formalizes and expands Hudson River Park's 14th Street Park in this area as well. So a view looking west uh, from the High Line at this intersection today, and a view in the potential future of a capital build um, for what this intersection could look like. Um, this is a, what I think is a really beautiful image that sort of shows you a broad picture when you begin to zoom in and zoom in on it. Um, there's a whole bunch of things um, that are taking place here to make changes. And, and like I said, I kept highlighting um, the sidewalk expansions and the bulb outs to reduce crossing time for pedestrians to make sure that when vehicles are turning, they're largely doing it at a 90 degree angle. Um, and they're not sort of doing these swings into intersections, you know, putting them at greater conflict um, with pedestrians and cyclists in the area. So that is, that, that, that's it. Um, this is sort of the summary slide um, of the six projects and sort of the, the, the big picture idea of each of them, 14th Street, Washington, Gansport Landing, 10th Avenue, 14th and 10th. And then what we didn't share with you today is the Chelsea Market Streets. Um, but, you know, when you put together a vision, um, it is a start. And we like to start somewhere so we can begin talking about it. And that's the whole part of this plan. We are, we are here with you tonight, um, sort of taking on a roadshow, showing you a product we are um, extremely proud of, thanks to the feedback we received um, from CB2, CB4, and a whole bunch of our stakeholders. Um, and of course, our teams at WXY and Sam Schwartz as well. So Shirley, I pass it back to you to do the moderating Q&A, and we are, we're here for it. Great. Okay, so uh, as I said before, first the committee, and I see that Ritu is immediately ready to ask a question. Go to it, Ritu. Okay, Jeffrey, that was an awesome presentation. Um, I wish I could have slowed you down by like maybe 35 RPM or something like that. Um, <laughs> so my questions are, Will, do you have any influence on continuing the bike lane on 14th Street as you envision it in the meatpacking district? I mean, you know, technically our boundary goes to 8th Avenue. We didn't propose it there in part because, you know, Hudson Street is the first connecting point, right? The southbound protected bike lane there. So, and from there you can kind of get to the 11th and, and 12th Street uh, lanes. So frankly, we do in an ideal scenario, it would be great if we could do that. Logistically, we didn't want to sort of. Um, have you spoken point, to DOT about this? Uh, we certainly have. Um, they were a stakeholder and a partner in this all along. Um, and like it, it is not something that is is by any means impossible. We didn't want to put out things that were impossible. Um, so, you know, maybe it could go to 8th Avenue a little bit further. But the reason we thought it was appropriate tonight was because you can pick up, you know, the Hudson Street lane. At, at 14th Street. Okay, and then one other small question, which is um, with regards to the public spaces um, using the roadbed, will, who will maintain that? Will that be MPD? Hi, that's us. Okay. Um, so, you know, we are very much aware that with this type of work comes greater responsibility. We made that commitment very clear to you guys and to the city as it relates to Gansevoort Landing. Um, and we understand, you know, folks um, enjoy the neighborhood in part because of the maintenance that our teams do. And we know that that is a big part of the, that would be any part of what we do if any of these projects move forward. Okay, okay. I, I'm gonna wait to hear the others. Okay, sure. I, I see George is next, George Hikalis. Am I unmuted? You certainly are. Hi, George. I, I'm sorry, I'm shouting too loud. Um, uh, it's the one kind of preliminary comment is that I remember the good old days when we fought Westway, and this is sort of a, a core piece of that. And the the crumbs were left over, over, but we didn't know what to do with it except we didn't want that highway there. Now the question is, uh, for, if, if this is to become a major tourist attraction, it's really important to have good public transit there. And while not a word has been said about whether the 
evil bus system will still be there necessarily. We'll have to have it. Can't we do something that makes traveling by surface transit seem interesting and important as a key piece of the redevelopment here? I'll just leave that nasty comment on my apologies for you. So hard. Well, I don't think it was a nasty comment. We are major proponents of public transit. Um, you know, the there originally was going to be a stop on the 14 at 14th and 10th. Um, the route didn't get changed. This this potentially could support that. Um, in no way is this meant to undercut public transit. We think um, it could improve it and make it, you know, potentially more appealing. Um, it doesn't add or propose any changes, but certainly the 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 three bus routes, four bus routes um, that are in this general vicinity. Um, I think would be considered to be well served by what we're proposing here. Okay, thank you. And Dan, uh, before I, uh, George, were you proposing like a trolley system above ground? Because I think he was proposing already. a Vision fourteen, like he did on Vision forty two. <laughs> exactly. So just to be clear, that it doesn't necessarily have to be a subway, right, George? Your point is it, it could be a connecting surface. above ground trolley. Is above that... ground, whether it's a bus or steel wheeled. Uh, just having public transit seem to be a more central part of this will encourage more people to use it. And this is a, an area you want to have tourists because you're having all this commercial activity and the people living here can't generate that much activity. So you would like to have, hey, let's go to a Gansborg or something and, and we'll take the Crosstown bus from Union Square or whatever. It, it ought to be thought of as a key piece of this. Just my uh, point of view, I'm going to stop talking because it's, uh, I think the point is made. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, George. Well, let's go on to Dan again. Yeah, so I, 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 like I'm, I, I was, I'm listening to you, Jeffrey, and I feel like I'm in a fairy tale. Uh, how do we pay for this? I mean, oh, I love the plan. It's got so much Dan, detail. I got to read it. You had to be the one to ask that question, of course. Um, look, I mean, we are... Um, figuring that out, um, we, you know, a key component was safety. Um, and like some of these intersections right now are just not safe. And so it's a question of like figuring out priority at DOT. Um, obviously, everybody has ideas of, of what should be improved and where. Um, we think this is a really good one that's worthy of attention. So we want public dollars for it. Frankly, um, I recently started talking to uh, the congressman's office because, you know, the infrastructure bill was passed. but. I'll be honest, it was several thousand pages and so I haven't read it, um, but there is gonna be a way that we can channel money from that project to things like this, because it is indeed, you know, it's not just about uh, vehicles, but it's doing stuff for cyclists and PEDs, which we also, we know was a part of the, you know, the infrastructure package. Dan, it's also why we wanted to piece the projects into six different parts, right? So like we could do one and it would be a really good improvement. Um, we understand that like it would be significant to undertake all these, especially all at once. We don't anticipate that um, being a reality. But I mean, I, I can't print money. Um, so it's we're having discussions of whether or not this is public private partnership, a la Hudson Square. Um, so, you know, sort of right now for me, all options are on the table um, is, is what it's like. Yeah, you can. I'll, I'll just add in there, right? Um, a big impetus for creating this project was that you know the the areas we outlined in red they exist no matter what we do and so to make sure that everyone's really well aware of the problems that we're quite familiar with in this community board um, in this area was really critical because no matter what whatever the solution may be to this issue right if we're not addressing it proactively we're going to have to respond uh, when there becomes a, a true you know public safety concern you know a real issue here I mean luckily no one's you know there's been no major issue at the moment we don't want that to be the case. And so we want to be proactive. Our hope is that providing this vision to the city and to our stakeholders means that um, there's something that people can hold on to and grasp onto and kind of push forward with, uh, with strong momentum. And that there isn't the need to reinvent the wheel every time someone comes up with an idea or like sees a problem here and that we can really tackle them. Well, yeah, you know, we asked for a master plan. I think several members of our community did and you certainly gave it to us. So we, we see it's not piecemeal. So I appreciate that. Now, last month we saw, you know, uh, a Gonzibor crossing, the little parklet. You also presented a new plan, kind of a, a better 
uh, overhaul plan. So if one is going to go through, should they both not be going through together? Or what's the what's so the for that? The city's plan doesn't negate what we're proposing because we are you know, very happy with what the city's put forth. It's reflective of what we've done. We want to go a little bit further and add that crossing on 9A. That's a key additional component. Um, but it doesn't, what the city's doing is really is putting that plaza in sort of on and, and demarcating those areas on both sides of 10th Avenue south of Gansevoort. We'd like to go a little further and do something in front of the Whitney as well, but it doesn't, it's sort of a plus plus and we were very happy with, you know, that those conversations started while we were taking this study up and that DOT was so willing to move on it um, and have that become real next year. Okay, Dan. So I'm then good, thank we're you. On Thanks very much. Jack. We're on to Janet. Um, so thank you. Very exciting. Uh, so um, I guess just a few quick, quick building on Dan's question. So looking at the plan, Gansford Plaza then becomes a that space becomes basically a shared street, right? In your your final version, that it's available for the occasional car, but it looks uh, as if Gansford. it's going to we eliminate vehicular access south of Gansevoort Street on 10th Avenue in the capital version, because you, you would be able to get from a vehicle from Gansevoort Street directly onto 9A. Um, but the, I'm probably referring to the wrong spot, the, the, the place where the Whitney needs occasional access to do loading and unloading. Yeah, let me- I'm They would be right doing now. that in what would be the pedestrian, the occasional access in the pedestrian space. So it is, so as you can see here, um, the area that I have highlighted, right? Yeah. That, is, uh, that, that becomes a permanent plaza because your vehicles only need to go um, to 9A off of Gansevoort Street. Okay. We okay, created great. that end in front of the Whitney here because the vehicular access is circular here down on, on 10th Avenue. And you can sort of this little zone here is a chute that those trucks would be able to exit from the museum directly onto 9A4. So it doesn't really become a shared street. We're creating sort of individual segments and allowing what, what we see as a more sort of standard intersection at Gansport and 9A, right? Creating a 90 degree factor. So cars can make that right hand or left hand turn to go north or south off of Gansport Street. And then creating sort of a, a loading dead end for the Whitney um, and the meat market. Okay, um, thank you. Um, and then this is a, I guess, kind of a design question. I mean, the beauty of Ninth Avenue really is that it's linear and you have actually increased the pedestrian space there because people walk in straight lines, they don't do a curvy thing. So Washington Street, I guess you've made the decision that you don't actually, like you have, you've created places to sit, but you haven't by doing that curvy thing for the cars, you actually haven't increased circulation space. And you know, it seems like on weekends, sometimes Washington Street gets pretty busy, but I guess I'm curious, like what went into that thinking? Well, it's interesting, because I'm sure you remember like all the iterations on the Ninth Avenue redesign also, right? And like where we landed was very different from where it started. And this vision, if, if Washington Street goes forward, I imagine that when it's done, it will look quite different than what we're proposing today because we might realize that that linear treatment on one side of the avenue or the other is indeed more effective. One of the reasons we, we didn't propose that in this round is because we the, the slow street idea, um, right? If a vehicle can go in a straight line, it's gonna go fast. Uh, we wanted to sort of have a safe mixing way for peds and cyclists and vehicles. And so getting the car to make the turn organically slows it down a little bit. Um, and that was the thinking for this. It certainly might not be the case if it, that project is, uh, you know, green lit and formalized. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, yeah, that's it. I was going to ask about the Eighth Avenue connection on the bike lane, but Ritu covered that, and I and I understand your thinking on on that. Um, and then I don't know, and this might be too small too. We had talked about, did you discover there was no really need for containerization of garbage? Like you didn't mention that. <laughs> uh, Ms. Liff, that will be for another meeting. Okay. <laughs> um, um, you know, this is purposefully light on detail because when okay. we decide to move forward with 
14th Street or Washington Street will be back to for the public process. And that may inform the block that has containerization. That's gonna inform specifically where the loading zone is, right? So um, we didn't sort of go that minute in, in this project, in this proposal. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, anyone else? Including our full board members, Bonnie, you, you have something. Yeah. Right. Thanks, Jeffrey, for the presentation. Um, so I, one of the questions I was going to ask was following up on your Gansevoort area about the crossing at Gansevoort Street and why why we weren't doing that now um, with DOT. So, but I think that's excellent. I I mean, it's so needed there. So I just hope that can get done sooner th rather than later. Yeah, we so. You know, state DOT is notoriously difficult, but we were able to meet with them and shared like preliminary stuff in the discussion and reminded them of like their failings of like crossings in, in the past and how this is kind of uh, right for it because there's a traffic light mm -hmm. and you know, with Gansevoort Peninsula happening. Um, we are talking to the trust, Noreen and her team about um, do they have any design changes that would need to be made on their side mm -hmm. of the highway to accommodate a crosswalk? Um, so, you know, those are very much ongoing discussions. Great. I think that'll be really helpful to everybody to not have to go further south on that. So, so then my next question sort of pegs up what Ritu was saying about the bike lanes. They're going across 14th Street, and then, yes, they can come down on Hudson to go to 11th, 12th. We all know all the bike messengers were already going all across 14th Street in the bus lane continuously. So I have a concern. They're not going to not do that. Now they have bike lanes in the middle. I mean, I just think something has to be in the plan to, in reality, what's going to happen because I'm just saying, you know, they're not going to. Do you mean like on that one block we're proposing for 14th street that. Right. Um, I guess I'm just trying to think through what the reality is. Like if, if is, is they're going to keep going the, straight, but probably go up. They'll, they'll probably go straight and then yes, go over to the be. side, you know? And, You're exactly right. And so I'm just going to encourage you to get those bike lanes all the way across 14th Street because they're using them as it is now. And I know it's not your job. Keep right? that coming. We love, uh, like, make that noise, Donna. Let's keep making so, that noise. So, and then my, my next thing, which I think you will not be surprised to hear from me, is that this conveniently stops at 14th Street and 9th Avenue and not does not go south on 9th Avenue through to Gansevoort Street. So 9th Avenue, the discussion about 9th Avenue is left out of this one, you know, once once you get into the district. And as you know, there are a lot of problems with 9th Avenue with the traffic flow. So looking at this holistically, whatever you are doing on 10th Avenue, Washington Street, all of that is also going to impact 9th Avenue. And I, where does that fit in here? I, I mean, offline, I could have a bunch of conversations about the issues on Ninth Avenue, which we've yeah. had some of those, but anything you do here is going to impact that. Look, so, we are regularly pushing DOT to change the light time at 14th Street, right? Um, right? That's the lowest hanging fruit, theoretically, that we could use to, to do that. Um, the 13th Street flip didn't do as much as a, in terms of a success as we thought it was going to. Um, and even, you know, we, we sort of turned off the open street on 13th street and even that didn't change, frankly, a lot at all, as you, as you know. Mm -hmm. Um, so we, because we sort of, the, our gist is actually by removing that, that, um, you know, the 10th Avenue off ramp, it actually keeps more traffic on the highway is a lot of the thinking, uh, behind this and that you have to make a concerted effort to get, um, to make your plan to come to meet packing. And that meatpacking isn't necessarily, doesn't become a pass through, um, but like you're using it as your destination. Or if you live just to the South and you happen to be driving or, in your, or you're in a cab, right? You're making those movements in a, in a very um, thoughtful way because uh, it's kind of how you have to get around. Mm -hmm. um, 
So let me just follow up then. I, one of your high priorities is the taxi for hire pickup and drop off areas. Maybe that's more in the details in this presentation, but I saw nothing about that in this plan. You're absolutely and, right. And, and all of those black cars are what is jamming up Ninth Avenue. So most of those people that they are not driving through, nobody's choosing to drive through meatpacking because it's a convenient thing to do. They're there because, because it's a destination, which is great for retail and all of that. Um, but where are the where are are they going? And then so I'll loop that into your plan for Janet's thing with the curving on Washington Street. That's already it jammed up because of all the cabs in the no standing zones and the four higher vehicles by the standard. So so that's another thing to consider as you're weaving that through, even just putting in more walking space, which would be great. Yep. Um we still need to accommodate unless we're figuring another way for people to get to the standard, like where are these cars going? So it's not a parking lot over there. You are hundred percent correct. It's, it's one of the main reasons like we really like that 13th street at Washington, right? That goes West and you can get onto 10th and make right. your way South there to sort of get out of the neighborhood. And then further South, if you're below 13th street, right, you can continue to do that on Gansevoort. Um, I mean, I think some of the things that we've learned is that, um, if you if you choke things enough, or if you if you make it so you have to think enough, people are actually going to think through it, and that's kind of part of the goal here. Make the turn onto Thirteenth Street to drop somebody off at the standard. Like, don't do it stopping in the middle of of, of a narrowed Washington Street. Of course, you we all know that the world is not ideal, um, and and rarely will that happen. But um, you know, I do think that. It's the same thing, like why we want to slow the speed of traffic. Like thinking about what meatpacking as like a a slower, um, a slow street neighborhood, and how does that help with um, traffic flow and like the the double park issues and, and sort of how that backs up on ninth. Yeah. Um, I don't think there's a panacea. I don't think there's a silver bullet to any of it. Is part of the problem. Um, I think the drop off the drop off areas really need to be looked at for the district because a lot of people take the black cars and that's not going to go away and then reinforcing the no standing and then the one other thing I had with the bike lanes which is not in our district but leads into our district so they're coming down 10th avenue for there's a city bike on I believe right in on on um just 10th on the avenue there in front of Genesis there's another one on Washington I know Dan and Shirley have been working at getting another one in the area someplace by the Whitney or so. How are the bike and somebody, let's say somebody's on city bike coming down to the area. How are they getting from north of 14th Street on 10th Avenue? Where are they going to get to the city bike stations that are south of 14th Street in our district without going across 14th Street, hoping they're going to take that to, you know what I'm saying? Because they're yeah, going to want to go straight down. Every um, there, we don't have a proposal for a sort of a bike connect, a formal bike connection there. I think one of the, the reasons we don't is because we do expect a reduction in vehicular volume. And so it, the street inherently is, is sort of slightly safer for a cyclist. Um, and, you know, when I think about my route, when I sort of buy, I live in Hell's Kitchen, so I bike down the west side and then I get off at 14th Street and I immediately go down to sort of the backside of 10th Avenue across Little West 12th, and then down to sort of Washington and Horatio to dock my city bike. And so I think that movement will, will sort of remain organic. Um, that's not to say the city doesn't, you know, originally the city had talked about the bike lane for 10th Avenue starting at 13th Street. And so that would have extended it further south. Um, I haven't, we haven't received whether or not that will happen, but you're right that the, it, it, there's sort of a drop off that like, there's a void. Okay, thank you. I see that Dan wants to ask something else. Yeah, it's, it's almost like a point and a request. It's just there's so much to digest here that and there's so many details that are missing. We're going to be seeing you a lot in the future, I imagine. And I would recommend we do piece by piece if you have six pieces, because I think, you know, we could all ask a thousand questions and make a thousand different recommendations, whether it's containers or this or that or connectivity. But uh, I just think that overall, love the plan, but we know we need more details from you. And we couldn't agree. I, we couldn't implement any of this, right, without sort of digging in more. And it's exactly why, like, when we do come back, you're going to hear from us on one project at a time, right? Not like one <laughs> through three, because frankly, nobody could handle that capacity. And we, we want things to be um, successful and effective. And so really drilling down in the details is super important. Okay. 
I think I think it's my turn. Hey. <laughs> so, you know, I looked just at our original resolution in response to the May presentation, and uh, we had a lot of comments. But one of the things I was curious about is how much you're working with DOT about signage and signals. There was a concern about signage and signals and just wondering how you're handling that and uh, how it goes hand in hand with the initial projects and on and on. Yeah, I think that's sort of a discussion that that sort of as we move forward with a particular project, those details will be realized because obviously there'd be significant sign changes that would need to be made. Right. Let's just say if we undertook the intersection of you know 14th and 10th. Um, so obviously, I mean, that literally there will have to be sign changes further, much further south of meatpacking on 9A. Um, so like I said, DOT has been a stakeholder from day one on this. This plan was not a surprise when we presented it to them because they were a part of our, our feedback. Um, and we can't do anything um, without their green light. And Shirley, when you say signage, I think both vehicular and pedestrian. So like, is there wayfinding consideration? Sure, wayfinding, exactly. Yep, right. absolutely. So everything. So maybe when you do your little pieces and presentations, you'll tell us what's planned for the signage as well. Absolutely. Okay. Well, the other, you know, one of the major things, of course, and again, this is out of your hands, but just wondering your reaction is how do we get the proper enforcement? Uh, what is the kind of interface with NYPD that you're doing? I mean, I, I, I would say I put makeup on to get rid of the bruises from banging my head against the wall <laughs> about the lack of enforcement. Um, you know, I, I don't know. Um, Evan deals with this um, every single day uh, and his job is sort of overseeing neighborhood operations. You guys have met right. Kevin Kudo on our team also. And like that's, it's, it is a constant. Um, we find sort of a, 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 a cherry picking of enforcement. Like, sure, we'll do this, but we're not gonna do that. Um, it's, it's, and we have two precincts. So um, it, that, that throws a variable in our, in our mix as well. Sure. But you are saying that um, the bid is involved, at least to some degree, in trying to get the proper enforcement. Oh, oh God, yes. We are um, very much so, what, be it, you know, 311 reporting direct connects to precinct houses, to downtown. And it's not just the precincts also, right? It's, it's Department of Consumer and Worker Protection. Um, it is um, DOT, obviously, is a major factor. So we are very much a part of pushing for more enforcement. It would make our jobs easier if things were enforced. Yeah. I, I just wondered, you know, if you had any more <laughs> oomph yep. about it than we have been able to do, because certainly where we try, but I don't think we get that much response. We get some. Right. Well, maybe if we all work together. And um, here's here's just a question based on what your original calendar was. And it was just about now that you were going to start on programmatic pilots and you haven't yet have you right no and any idea when we i mean Gant, we're like gansport landing the area that we're calling south of the whitney that the sort of the plaza um that's kind of going to be the first and we're really pushing for that to be installed by the flower show um so the second weekend in june and of course by me saying that out loud that means i'm going to be working really really hard to get dot to do that um, oh, and yeah. even, frankly, one of the things, Shirley, that since you mentioned the sort of programmatic pilots of it, let's say DOT doesn't install it by that time. What we might do is stand up just like a week long pilot of what it would be like in that area, sort of a la what our friends in Soho did on Prince Street, right? Um, so just to sort of experiment with what the use of the space is like, like that's very possible depending on, on DOT's schedule. They know that we're gonna make a full court push um right. to get that installed by the second weekend in june yeah and and we're always kind of constrained by what how, how fast dot gets to these things yep. so again a question with enthusiasm but with understanding and hoping and so you know like we would, we would certainly if we decide to you know make us plaza somewhere else or expand um a, a sidewalk temporarily like we're going to be coming back to you to talk to you about it 
Um, so we'll okay. be keeping you posted on that stuff for sure. Okay. And I see Frederica has a question or comment or there you go, Frederica. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, Jeffrey, it's all very exciting. I wondered uh, if your intention is to come back to the community board with the various parts, what are you looking for from us now? This was, we, we wanted to share the product. We're kind of bragging. Um, and because we feel really, we're really proud of this. Um, I don't know that we um, expect anything from you tonight. Um, one of the things that we're soliciting for is, 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 is reactions. Um, what stands out as a priority to the committee? Um, what uh, might we put sort of further back on the burner? Those kinds of things would be useful as we have conversations with City Hall um, and you know our leaders in government. But I think as it relates to like you know the details, I would encourage you to not waste time on that this evening because you know it's going to come back in the individual project form. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. what we'll want to dig in on the details. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, we did get a uh, one very detailed letter from a constituent with a, well, a bunch of comments. And I, I just would like to bring a couple of these up and, and ask questions. So I guess one of our things was uh, double parking in some respects, if that helps the loading of freight, she was worried that there wouldn't be double parking on 14th Street. I'm not gonna comment on that. What I am gonna say is what are the, What's the vision for loading and unloading? We, we didn't get too much of that, right? That it needs to continue um, and be sort of uh, even more effective than it is today. You know, the changes that right. we proposed on 14th Street, right now 14th is um, it's really not, a. If there's no parking during the day except for commercial loading and unloading. Um, so like that is all meant to continue happening. Um, the big, it's a long block, uh, so, um, right, like utilizing the Washington Street mm -hmm. intersection would be important. Um, there's two bus stops on the stretch of 14th between 9th and 10th. Um, you know, I, I think that, I don't know a perfect scenario where double parking stops, um, but the reason we wanna keep the curb moving is so that somebody can pull over and drop somebody off or grab the box from inside the store. Um, and, and that's something we want to make sure can happen. Okay, so you will be tending to, to that. I think we certainly want to be aware, right? Like um, mm -hmm. of, of that kind of stuff. You know, Highline Stages on the north side of 14th Street, they have um, events, um, right? Big fashion week place, um, de destination for fashion shows. Um, they're a big film production studio. So like stuff's gonna happen uh, and it will continue mm -hmm. to happen. And we want to make sure that it can do so um, successfully and not affect the flow of traffic either. Okay. And there was another question, or maybe even two. One was about the lighting, the overpass lighting. And somehow she had a, a concern that it really wasn't needed. So I, could you address that? Yeah, I mean, we, um, the area uh, under the uh, High Line, this is all, this is on yeah, 15th uh, and 16th Street. Um, there's a span of the High Line that stretches over 10th Avenue at 16th. Um, it's right. quite dark under there. Um, by no means, I, Surely you shared this email with me, which I appreciate. And by no means are we thinking of like um, making a light show out of the underbelly of the High Line. It is to really make it so that you can actually yeah, just- That sounds kind of cool. <laughs> maybe, maybe once a year it could happen, but um, you know, using it as a way to um, safety is a factor and then sort of to know where you are also. Um, but by no means was it meant to sort of detract um, from the High Line. Okay. And again, I think she asked if, uh, <laughs> I think I know the answer, but I just want you to say it right now, um, in terms of, of the flow of traffic at 14th Street and uh, the, the con she's concerned it might go into smaller residential streets and so on. And I just, she had asked, has that been studied? And I, I'm quite sure you have studied that whole area, but I just wanted your feedback on it right now. Yeah, um, a couple of things like the 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 only vehicular change where we're, there's two vehicle changes that are that would be considered significant that we're proposing, that Washington Street becomes southbound only, and we don't since Washington Street is already southbound south of 
Little West 12th Street. We don't see how changing it all southbound for two additional blocks affects traffic flow further in the village. And then that, you know, no longer allowing a northbound movement off of the highway onto 10th Avenue. Um, frankly, I, I don't see how that puts traffic into the village um, because you can't get off the highway into the village, you know, very particular spots. Can you get on and off the highway into the village? And then to the north of 14th Street, you're just making the more concerted effort to turn on the block you need. So if you're going to 16th Street, right, you're going to 18th, or you're going to Lincoln Tunnel, you're probably going to do it at 30th Street now. Um, so that's that's uh, the reaction there. But to sort of get back to the just the regular conversation we have, we are beating the drum, and we like that you're beating the drum on the light signal at 14th and 9th. Like that is just something, you know. I, it took us seven years to get a stop sign at Little West 12th Street in Washington. Um, so like we are um, true. Like it is. I wrote I, the rezo. You see? <laughs> What's exactly. amazing is, is that it's not even surprising, right? <laughs> Um, so we are, we're, you know, we're right with you as it relates to the things that could make things better that the city is just not moving on. Okay, thanks. So Dan, what have we got in terms of uh, our... We have a couple of hands raised. Um, we have Jonathan uh, Weitzman and we have Michael Markowitz. Okay, so let's uh, get them up. So that's we'll get Jonathan is being promoted now. Okay. He needs to accept it. Okay. Okay. And you said in Michael Markowitz? Yeah, you want me to do both at the same time? May as well, sure. I, I somehow don't see them. Yeah, they're not accepting yet. So they have to accept the invitation. Oh, Jonathan, Michael, are you there? Please accept our invitation. I don't know. I said, he, he says he accepted. Yeah, well, I'm writing promoting, and I don't know why it's not going in. I'm just going to allow them to talk. Okay. There is one. Okay, I'm going to allow. It is Michael. Go ahead, Michael. You can talk. I think you're, if you unmute, you have the floor. All right, thanks very much. Let me lower my hand. Uh, first of all, uh, I apologize for missing the first piece of this, but I did have a chance to review the information on the link and caught the tail end of the presentation. Um, so a couple things, and uh, before going further, I see I'm on a clock. I appreciate that. Uh, how much time would you like me to limit myself to, Shirley? Well, it's two minutes. I guess you, yeah, you could also look on the chat and see what our rules and guidelines are. All right, well, I'm Please reclaiming my time for guidance to the guidelines. Two minutes okay, is fine. Okay, so we better give him a little more time. Than... All right, well, I was just kidding. I'm very compact. Um, so a couple things, bang, 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 because I talk like I write, which is in bullets. Uh, first, uh, Jeffrey and Evan and everybody, I so appreciate how much work goes into a conceptual effort like this, having been part of a good number of them in my career as a civil engineer. It's a tremendous amount of work, and... Uh, my hats off to you because you looked at so many different aspects of this. Um, not necessarily at the end of the day that I'm going to agree with the concept, but I just want to say I appreciate uh, the presentation and how much went into it. Um, I want to return to the description of the traffic and transportation committee, and that is primarily to move traffic and people and goods and services. Clearly, this proposal would have the contrary effect. The impact of this proposal is much, much broader. The devil is in the details is the corny quote, but in a master plan concept like this, what really matters isn't the details, which can always be worked out and tweaked. It's the big picture and specifically crimping off that intersection of West Street, 14th Street, 10th Avenue cannot be minimized. That is huge, 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 huge. Now, procedurally, I have severe uh, heartache and objection to that there is no time for public awareness or contribution. Uh, this material, as far as I'm aware, just came out yesterday. So in closing, let me just urge the uh, subcommittee of committee board two, uh, committee of community board two, sorry, tongue tied. Please do not pass a resolution supporting this tonight. This dialogue needs to continue. We need traffic numbers and projections on the impact on those traffic numbers. And uh, I do not 
sincerely want to have to speak up again at a full board meeting that there was objection in the committee when the resolution says it was unanimous. Thank you very much. Uh, I would just like to uh, direct you, Michael, to the CB2 website and look for the description of the Traffic and Transportation Committee, which is an awful lot broader than just moving people in traffic, which is the <laughs> old description of what traffic and transportation of transportation was about. It's gone much further than that since that, which was probably 50 years ago or so. So I just want to direct you, just see what our goals are supposed to be, because they're much broader than that. Okay. Uh, Adam Zeldin wants to, what, answer? Do you want to answer, Michael, or ask him a question? Surely, I was also just going to point out exactly what you pointed out, that there's a much broader, more modern description of the uh, effort of, of the committee. I'd also point yeah. out that, you know, when we talk about unanimous committee vote, we're talking about members of the committee. Uh, and, you know, that line on the resolution is just tallying the vote from the business session. Okay, uh, Frederica. Yeah, I did ask uh, Jeffy what he was expecting from us now, and he was not urging us to write a resolution. Mm -hmm. Correct, Jeffy? Yeah, I. You, the committee is welcome to make its own decision, but there's there's nothing, frankly, that would kind of come at it at this point. We wanted to, this is a starting point for this vision. Um, and so, you know, we made it public on September 29th of this year. Uh, there's been quite a bit of press on this. Um, you know, we presented, we got feedback from the community board two back in May. Uh, board four also had a public hearing, a public meeting on this um, as well. And then a couple of block associations um, as well in terms of, of input. And then here we are tonight having the very first conversation um, on the plan as the whole. And I would just say that we will decide whether we do a resolution or not in business session. Of course. And it will be based on the input we get tonight. And it was on the last one too. Uh, we have Jonathan who's ready to speak. I think he's unmuted. Am I unmuted? Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, so dear members of the board and to the bid, uh, Jeffrey, thank you for your presentation. As always, thank you for the board for your diligence and dedication to the community and handling all the innuendos and tasks presented. Uh, I'm at this meeting as a resident and to simply state that the meatpacking bid plan has missed the detailing of the impact to its district and the surrounding neighborhoods. The plan lacks an understanding what will inevitably create the creation of more congestion the increased and often greater risk to pedestrian safety and their health in surrounding neighborhoods. The meatpacking bid plan will create physical bottlenecks as exemplified in a study by the Department of Transportation. Physical bottlenecks are locations where the physical capacity is restricted with flows from upstream sections being funneled into smaller downtown segments. This is roughly the same as a storm pipe that can carry only so much water. My question to the bid is a couple of questions. Where is the plan? Where in the plan is it currently referenced to deal with the overflow of parking traffic and congestion to the district and other neighborhoods? Other question. Where in the plan is it detailed how will cars park and double park in streets that are narrowed down to only one lane in streets? Where is the plan of safety for our residents and plan for our police, fire trucks, and ambulances to navigate to get to an emergency area? in the district and its surrounding areas. And I would also ask if the bid can also clarify where in their presentation is actual analysis and references done by Sam Schwartz traffic engineers and to clarify what those engineers impact analysis are on the congestion in the district. Again, the open program, I'm in full support of it, but it must consider all members of the community, those who walk, those who bike and those who work and those who drive and those who live in CB2. In the end, I would think that this committee's focus is and has always been about the safety of its residents and not about a design and a plan that by consequence increases congestion, intensifies safety issues and hinders access to parking and flow. Hey, Jonathan, could you wrap it up? Thanks. Uh... In fact, it should be the exact opposite. 
And again, thank you again for everybody's participation. And I'm always willing to help in trying to better the community. So I'm here, Jeffrey, if you need me and any other members. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. Jeffrey, do you want to address that at all, like the Sam Schwartz portion or? Um, I mean, I guess the, the couple of factors are, you know, there's no parking today on Washington Street. Um, it's commercial only, uh, loading and unloading, and that would continue under this plan. Um, in terms of emergency access, we deal with that regularly, and our open streets have actually, um, this is the case in, in a lot of the open streets in the city, but um, like an ambulance can get cross town quicker on Gansevoort Street um, when they've got to jump out and move those barricades than when it's, it's blocked with traffic. So um, in our discussions with DOT and FDNY, um, that, that's been the, the sort of the internal reaction. Um, and I guess I go back to the fact that this is a vision uh, that will be sort of filled in with detail as we take um, each project up along the way. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else down that is looking to I don't talk? see anyone else that hasn't spoken already now. Okay, uh, so Pete this, Davies. Pete Davis has just raised his oh, hand. Pete Davies, hi Pete. Let me go ahead. Can we elevate Pete? Come out. I, I have tried. There we go. Okay. Hi, Pete. Okay. Uh thank you. Yeah, I was just curious. Um, when you're doing the visioning, does that include uh, analyzing financials? And if so, what is the projected cost of the capital plan that you've presented? Thank you. Sure. Uh, we did not. That is a sort of a next phase undertaking um, that we would do, Pete. Um, there is a formula that um, engineers and stuff like that use, and we haven't gone that route yet, frankly, because um, this is super broad. And we didn't, from the bids perspective, I didn't need to be spending our money on a on a budget that is not even realistic, given that each project needs to be taken sort of individually. So down the line, as we approach one, we'll obviously be having that conversation and that will all be a part of our next discussion. Yeah, I'll reach it. <clears throat> yeah, I just wanted to kind of chime in here um, to address some of the concerns that have been raised uh, by, the, by the public. M my understanding of what is taking place today is an overarching presentation of what the meatpacking bid in conjunction with stakeholders would like to see happen within uh, the area. There are things that would be changed, um, ameliorated uh, as the public provided input and as the stakeholders provided input, and that there is a long time between now and when any of this would actually be an actionable item for the board to consider, number one, um, or that you know, there would be any kind of implementation that would go on. So between now and that time, the public would be providing input, the board would be providing input, and other stakeholders would be providing input. Jeffrey, am, am, am I incorrect in my... You are 100% correct. So this is just merely the first overarching presentation, which will be further refined over the course of many, many months. Thanks, Riju. And Donna would like to chime in again. I just have a question on that. What is the timeline on this? When are you looking to start implementing it? I mean, I chuckle because again, we're, we are- 10 years um, for a light and it stopped fine. <laughs> exactly, right? Like that's it. And so part of it is packaging in an appealing way to City Hall, right? And the agencies and, and how can we figure out what we can achieve um, and in what way and you know, if we think about for if we think about 14, the intersection of 14 and 10, what can be done as a step one that is effective, aesthetically appealing and appropriate? Um, and, and what are the next steps after that? Um, you know, Councilmember Bacher enthusiastically um, was delighted by this plan, uh, Borough President Levine, likewise, many of them. So um, the questions were sort of how do we make it happen? And we're with you on that. And we've got to build public support for it. 
um, to show the city that this is definitely something they should, should take up. But Donna, if you, like if, I think from, a, you know, just to give you the example of Gansport Landing, we had a follow-up meeting with the with DOT after you know we presented to you guys last month, um, and there's a whole bunch of projects that they didn't finish this calendar year that are now getting pushed to next year, and so they kept telling Evan and I that we're going to do it in the spring, and then we asked them what month that was, and they said July, and I thought July was in the summer, um, so realistically, like what how this works is like we would want the city to do the whatever technical stuff has to happen, we need to leave to the city. But if there's like paint and planters and stuff, that that's the bid that would be really a part I, of that. I guess, Jeffrey, to be more specific, the plant, it might take the city forever, like it did with the light that we approved 10 years ago, I think, to put in that light at Washington and Gansport, right? But it was approved 10 years ago. Yeah. So, so not in terms of when it's being executed, but when you're coming to us, and we are weighing in on it because I think that's what everybody's concerned. You know, that's what what people are. When is our opportunity to weigh in? Not how long it takes the city to do it, but before you finalize your plans that 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 you are working with the city with. I mean, we are, so part of this road show is like hearing from you guys of like what is interesting and not, and like as we think about the city budget cycle, um, is there something that the council member goes, you should talk to me about this because like. I'm hearing that the city council likes this type of, of thing right now and that the administration likes this type of thing right now. Um, so like that could be a factor, uh, definitely gonna make a potential like budget push for something. Usually things like this, like you wanna get something in the budget that is just sort of a start. Um, I mean, I'll be honest, like I don't think we're gonna see something else the next year out of this plan besides Gansport Landing. Like, are we gonna keep pushing on other things, the light? You know the 13th street and gansport area absolutely um but it doesn't feel like there's going to be something on the ground in the next year um on this okay um, I, I just wanted to point out for for everybody or certainly the committee probably knows anyhow but all our guests and please spread the word that there are links to the plan um on the CB2 website, and you just have to look for the date of the meeting. And there are three links, I think. Uh, so take a good look and in case you haven't taken a look. And, and please spread the word to others to take a look too. And I think we will move on now. And the next uh, presentation is Thank you, Shirley. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for your time. You all. Thank you Thanks very much, much Evan and Jeffrey. And, uh, We'll look forward to hearing the next steps. Thank you. Uh, okay, <laughs> Jeffrey Rowland says he think, like the presentation. He's looking forward to the next six. <laughs> Thanks, Jeffrey Rowland. Uh, so anyhow, we're getting a presentation and of a design concept for a very different area of Community Board Two, and that's on King Street, uh, off Hudson Street, between Hudson and Greenwich, uh, for an enhanced. Paint King Street. And uh, Dan, uh, I guess we have quite a few folks to elevate. Uh, so we're starting right now. We've got Chris. I am on right? it. Yep. I'm working on it. So yeah. yeah. Okay. Chris. Should, should I mention them again or do you have? It's got, no, it's Neha, Max, Matt, Chris, and Hunter, right? Let's see. Neha, yeah, Max, Matt, Chris, Let's... and Hunter. Yes. And also, uh, okay. And okay. oh, and here's Samara Karasik, who's from the Hudson Square bid. And, and. Okay, we've got Neha, and we've got Chris. Um, we've got Matt. That's three. We've got two more to go. There's a Hunter and Max, right? We got yeah. Max. Yeah, who am I missing? A uh, Hunter. Hunter Newman. I don't know if he's here. He's oh, not. Matt, do you know is Hunter Newman here? It's okay. If it's okay. Hi, Shirley. It's Neha. It's okay if Hunter's not here. I just wanted to make sure that I'm able to present, um, pull the presentation up on screen. Okay, fine. So then let's, let's see pull the if you can. Here. Did you try the screen? It says multiple users can share. I only have an option for raising my hand or the All closed right. captioning. I don't have a share option. And then 
Neha, I'm going to try you again, Neha. Look at your screen, and you might have to press a button that says uh, you're accepting the promotion to panelist. Yeah, I did join as panelist. I don't know if I'm showing up as one. Still not. Yeah, it's possible she needs to be made a co-host or something? I could make you. It says, though, everybody should be able to share, but let's see. Multiple panelists, uh, panelists can share. Let's see. All right. All right. I'm going to make now try it. Try again. Everybody should be able to share. Neha, can you? Uh... I still no. I still I, I tried to join as a panelist a few times when it popped up, but I'm still seeing sort of the attendee format. Yeah, so let's try you again. Um, and yet we do have you on, on online. He says, I have a message here that says, Neha Desai will be re rejoining the webinar as a panelist. But you're Great. not, but it's not going. It's not going, no. So it's showing me a pop-up right now. I'm clicking join as panelist. Hey, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna send you a link. Um, you want me to rejoin the meeting? With a different link, perhaps, if you're not able to do it. I don't understand why it's not allowing, it's not, you're not being sent. I had the same problem actually with uh, the last two public speakers. They, they just it seemed only allowed to speak and not to update. So there might be a setting. So I'm gonna send you, um, or does, uh, Shirley, do you, do you have Neha's uh, email address? Oh, Nia, yeah. do you want to give us your I don't want to put link? our panelist yeah. link. Sure, it's neha dot -E d-e-s-a-i at heinz.com, h-i-n-e-s. So I can put it in the chat as well. Okay. What I want to do, I'm looking for the, uh, here it is. I'm going to go ahead and forward you this email. And you just put uh, it in the chat. Let me go down the chat. Okay, I'm sending, where it says click here to join, you're just, it might say Daniel Miller, unfortunately, we'll just change your name. <laughs> but it should bring you right in immediately as a panelist, you want to, Look at your email and then uh, sure. I'm looking for, I don't have it yet. Okay. Give it a minute. Here it is. Okay. Thank you everybody for your patience. And so uh, Nia will be rejoining us. <laughs> Once her Zoom reconnects, a new link. I am back, but I, but I'm no. You, she wants to be a panelist. I don't. Shouldn't you? You should be a panelist. Uh, sorry, still attendee, huh? So odd. Why would you be an attendee? Did, and you press the link that said "Join from a PC, Mac, or Android." The uh, the click here to join. Just said she doesn't see the share screen. Yeah. Why don't you send me the presentation? I guess I can kind of try to listen to it if you send it to me in a, a link, if you have it. You've, oh, her voice is not working either. Right. <laughs> I just I just want to experiment. Can you hear me? It's Samara. Yes. 
We can. Okay. So I don't know if you put me on in a different way. Like I, I definitely can't share my screen or anything or my video, but you can hear me. I wonder if you did something different and perhaps Neha could at least do it via audio if she could send you the presentation. Yeah, that's what I was recommending. She yeah. sends me the presentation and she'll do it by audio. It doesn't seem like, uh, it, it, you know, it's allowing me to say talk, but when you press promote to panelist, really nothing happens. So I just tried it with Chris, trying it with Nia's you. Nia's off now, I think. She's not on anymore. Hey, Dan, Chris Roth is here. Yeah, you, we you hear you, Chris. Nia. Chris, you're, are you still a panelist or your attendee? I believe I'm a panelist, but I, I can't see anything to- he, He's a panelist. Screen. Yeah. No, that's great. Right. So it worked for you. Let's keep trying it. I also just- and there, are two a panelist. there are two Samaras. Um, on as well as panelists, yeah. by the way. Uh, I don't know that she's showing up in attendees. My panelists doesn't show either Chris or the other woman as panelists. Really. Oh, Neha is asking Dan to send her your email and she'll send you the deck. Uh, I think I sent the email that uh, I just sent to you for the invitation to you just reply to that. And that's my email. I just sent you the invitation, Neha, to get into the become a use my link for the to be a panelist. It, it came from that email address. But I'll saying, say, okay, we'll do. All right. Okay, we hear you, Neha. Now we're we're moving there. You have Max as well. I just want to confirm my voice is working. Your yes. voice is working, Max. Wonderful. Well, technology. Okay, we're trying. You know, Zoom just updated its software, maybe. Oh. <laughs> I'm gonna try. Well, baby. Nia, I just wanna make sure that email that you just got from me, um, just, I just sent it again. I wrote, uh, is that the same email you just, you received before the click to join? Cause if I, if I do it, I become, I just tried it, my phone, I become a panelist again. I could also send it to Samara. Samara, sorry, Samara. And then you can maybe get it there. You'll see. This will make you, should be, it's my invitation. It's my link to get on. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I do gather that. Uh, yeah. Some input that that's changing of, of the versions of the Zoom can have an effect, but too late to worry about that. Yeah, I'm now me has back as an attendee again. Okay. So I have the power. Uh, oh, power okay. So now I'm going to get off and try to get back on. I have well, this. You have two of you, so now. Okay, I'm going to share my screen just for now until they be they see they can share the screen as well because I have multiple panelists can share it simultaneously. So if you get the opportunity to share, you should share. Um, and here we go. Oops. So far, a blank screen. Yeah, that's a blank screen. That does that didn't work. Oh, no. <laughs> hey Dan, do you want to make me a co-host and see if I can do it? <laughs> You're doubting me. I've been doing the, the timer and everything. It's that's nice. Let me just try it one more time. Let me just say that Jeffrey Rowland just said the, the current there, version there. is 5.12.2. Yeah. Oh, we got it. We got it. Yeah, yeah. I just pressed whiteboard instead of the actual oh, presentation. Great. They both looked white. Hey, okay. Dan, um, Neha and I are in the same office, so we'll just both talk through my computer if that works. Yeah, sure. Oh, that's fine. Just, just, uh, just making sure that my page turning. Just say turn page and I'll do it for you. Perfect. Perfect. So you guys can't see us, so unfortunately, right? No. Right. Can. Okay. Well, you're gonna have to use your imagination. You, I think goodness. I've I think I've gotten a chance to meet um a few of the folks on on the call. So uh appreciate the time here and we'll try to keep this presentation pretty brief um so we can move on to the commentary section, but we're sort of convening to, uh, here today to talk about 
the public improvements that we'd like to complete on King Street, which is, um, maybe we can go to the next slide, Dan. Just to orient us here, here we are in Hudson Square. We are um, looking to do some improvements along King Street, which is between Greenwich and Hudson. Um, just zooming out a bit, um, you know, I represent Heinz along with Chris, um, who's with me here. And Heinz took on an, uh, uh, an asset management assignment along with Trinity Church and Norges Bank to own and operate 12 buildings that are in the district and adjacent to the district. So this venture dates back to 2016, and it's a it's very much a long-term ownership structure where whereby we really view ourselves as um, stewards of the neighborhood, and we want to, um, you know, when we took on the assignment, we took a step back and took a look at what improvements we could make in the neighborhood to, to continue its transformation um, as uh, stakeholders in the district. So why King Street? Um, we really took a close look at the neighborhood when we, um, you know, uh, got into this um, acquisition and identified this street as a good candidate for improvements for green space. Um, this street terminates at the UPS loading docks, which you can see um, takes up about four blocks in the, in the district and is generally a very much an underutilized street. So sort of building off of the prior presentation where we heard about how do we repurpose space to make it more useful to the constituents in the neighborhood? Um, this seemed like a, a great place to start. Um, we've been working with the DOT here for over three years now to um, really work through what we can actually do here. This particular block has very wide sidewalks and you know, our ownership um, owns the buildings on either side of the street, which makes it a lot easier to get um, the approvals done you know, in terms of aligning interests. So um, maybe we can flip to the next page. Here's a, a map of, of the area here. And as you can see, and as we all know, this district has historically been a commercial and industrial district, and um, it's going through a big transformation right now. And looking at the, the developments that are coming online and the expected population increases, um, you know, we think adding extra public space, specifically in the northern part of the district, will help provide more seating and more public amenities to the people. Um, you know, one thing we heard in the prior presentation as well was really how do we um, take assets that we have, you know, that are that are here and not being used and convert them into something that really um, provides uh, amenities to all the different folks that are in the area. Um, so as we look to sort of take this on, we worked pretty closely with the bid. Um, they've undertaken uh, a lot of this work as well up and down Hudson Street. And we really worked hand in hand with them to draft off of that plan and to extend it along this extra block. Um, the interesting thing about this street is, is because it terminates um, at the loading docks, it's primarily used in the mornings for trucks and in the evenings for when the UPS trucks return, as well as the loading docks for the buildings themselves where we have deliveries that come in and out. So between the hours of call it, you know, noon and, and Four and then again in the evenings, it's a very quiet street, which um, means that you know there's an opportunity to make it a little bit more of a public um, gathering place. As we've noticed, you know, post COVID, um, the streets here have really filled up. The seating along Hudson ha is pretty much full on a daily basis. When we walk, you know, out to get our lunches, um, the bed, the seats are taken up. So this project is going to add a lot more seating in shaded areas for the public. Um, and I and I also want to just emphasize that. While we're focused on King Street in this presentation, we also have broader initiatives in the district that go hand in hand in, in sort of the neighborhood placemaking that Chris will get into later, which includes um, improving the retail environment, increasing lighting levels, and um, in, in expanding on the art program. I think we can go to the next page. I'll turn it over to Max here to talk through the site plan. Hi, yeah, Max Cohen from the Future Green Landscape Design Team. I've been working on this project for the past few years with um, the Heinz team and DOT. And as, as Neha said, really launching off some of the great work that's actively being installed from the bid along Hudson Street and figuring out how to work within some of the, the limitations of the existing site to create a really great space for the community and a linkage for people to get safely down to the river and and pause on the street. Um, currently, this the street's about 380 feet long by 80 feet wide, 
there's a relatively generous sidewalk on the north and the south of the street. There's about 15 feet on the south and close to 30 feet on the north of the street if you include the pop space for 375 Hudson. There's a sewer main that runs through the center of the street, which was really a kind of limiting factor with the 15 foot offset for where we could include um, additional trees and plant deeper planting beds along the street. There's also a number of utilities and con ed vaults and loading docks for the adjacent buildings that we really had to contend with when revisioning this street. Um, on the north side of the street as well, there's a few parking spots as well as a cluster of press parking that we tried to work with. Um, overall, the street really only left room for improvement. There's lots of opportunities there to transform the underutilized street and really try to meet some of the modern needs of the city and the neighborhood. Go next slide. So we're looking at, at a proposed plan for the street, which really looks to reclaim the street to enhance the sidewalks and the pedestrian experience, actually reclaiming space from the roadbed on the southwestern corner, taking about seven feet on the turn from Greenwich on the King Street, and then bumping out on the eastern side of the street, both on the south and the north with pedestrian bulb outs to create really kind of park-like spaces along the street, creating moments to pause, and really a kind of nicer, more green, rich pedestrian experience. Um, within these pockets of space, we're seeing increased planting beds, benches, lighting, and tree planters. There's also a number of salvaged granite platforms that we were able to salvage some sidewalk slabs from during the construction of 555 Greenwich that we're excited to reincorporate into the streetscape as kind of unique features that bring in some character and history to the streetscape. And a lot of the language that you see here is really inspired by the work done on the bid, really intended to build the kind of brand and identity of the neighborhood and create an experience for pedestrians and um, residents that's comfortable and feels more like the space belongs to the neighborhood rather than just the roadway. Next. In elevation on, on the um, top of the page, you see the view looking south. There's an accessoride shelter on the left of the page, which we're keeping in place, just shifting out toward the edge of the new roadway. There's a number of the stone platforms, raised tree planters along the street, lots of opportunities for artwork along the face of the building where we were really limited by some of the utilities mm -hmm. in the street. We really thought about creating activation along the full length of the street um, and really focusing on creating lush garden spaces at the ends of the streets. On this bottom of the page, you see the north elevation. Uh, there's garden spaces that go all the way across the street, really connecting, creating a green experience as you move, move all the way across the block, with the real highlight being the um, space on the right, right side of the page, the eastern, the northeastern corner of the street, with a large garden pocket built around two of the existing street trees. Next. Thanks, Max. I can I can pick it up from here. So as as everyone can see, this is the existing condition of King Street. Um, you know, it's really begging to be um, repurposed into something for the people. You know, as Max mentioned, there are very si uh, wide sidewalks, um, which we have worked with the DOT to uh, widen even further to provide maximum area for um, increased landscaping. Um, if we flip to the next slide. You can see here sort of the before and after proposal, um, increasing the, the, the tree canopy here um, by adding more um, potted trees, as well as an additional street tree on uh, near Greenwich, um, as well as these little pockets of seating that will really provide um, folks a, a place to rest and, and um, you know, just enjoy what is normally a quiet area 
Um, also on the weekends, this tends to be a, an extremely quiet street given the docks are, the loading docks are not nearly as active or, or pretty much inactive for the most part, um, which also provides um, essentially what we hope to be a community space in the future, which um, with, with the partnership of the bid and the residents, you know, this is a space that we would look, you know, we could program things like um, fairs on or, or green markets, et cetera. And so, um, you know, the street improvement, I think we can go to the next page. The street improvement is just part of the story. Um, you know, we're also working to, to complement it with an art program, as you can sort of see here in the back um, with the, the murals in the back, we would view this as a public amenity where we can have a, like an outdoor art gallery. People can use the space um, in that capacity. And we're also complementing it with um, better uh, retail that will speak to the constituents, including more local retailers in the area, which will improve lighting levels um, just by having active storefronts and also um, generating traffic in the evenings for um, you know nighttime destinations, as well as the weekend, just creating a better um, sense of public safety and security. I think we can go to the next page. This is just a quick recap of the seating plan, which um, Max touched on. The seating plan is going to shows basically the, the major areas of um, the clusters that we will plan to add. This will increase seat count by about 77 seats, um, which is a combination of uh, benches that have backrests, some benches that are built into planters, as well as those stone platforms that um, help re, you know, upcycle some of the sidewalk that was excavated. Next slide. I think I can hand it over um, to, I think, Corey and, and Samara on this one, but I, I can tee it off with just saying that we plan to um, partner with the bid in terms of maintenance of the street. Um, and, you know, th they have a uh, deep experience with the Hudson Street improvements and, and I'll let, let them take it from here. Oh, it looks like Corey and Samara cannot speak. Okay, well, I will continue here. And then um, if we can figure that out, maybe they can chime in at the end. I asked uh, Samara to unmute. She should be able to speak. Sound, it looks like they logged off and logged back in and now they cannot speak. We have one panelist here at the very end. The right, she says, ask to unmute. Okay. She asked if you can elevate her again. Okay. I uh, requested promotion to panelist. I'm asking to unmute, but she says this talking is permitted, as you can see. So as you can see me doing it, I'm trying to promote. I'm trying to promote. Well, nothing is coming through on her end. Yeah, um, weird. I can, yeah. I can just give a little recap then, you know, basically we've worked pretty closely with the bid to date to make sure that the details of the plantings, of the, the tree guards, of um, the benches, everything in the pavers as well, really matches their standard. And the purpose of that is to make sure that we um, make it easy for them to become our maintenance partner for this, for this project. Um, it's a natural fit for them to, you know, continue given that they're already ma maintaining, maintaining the Hudson streets, um, stretch and we will be working closely with them as well in terms of um, making sure the landscaping we pick, pick is complementary as well as um, using their maintenance mm -hmm. contractor to make sure that um, when it's planted that it survives and, and that we pick the right species etc um, you know they've learned a lot from um, their improvements in terms of um, what's working in terms of keeping the streets clean and safe and so we will really look to them to be a great partner and we'll also be um, you know, reaching out to the community um, to understand if there's any issues that that from a, you know, practical perspective that are coming up, you know, how we can address those and make sure that we solve them um, uh, so that they don't persist. I think we can go to the next slide. Did I skip one? There we go. Sorry. There you go. All right. I'll hand it off to Chris over here. All right. Thank you, Neha. So um, in short, we've come a really long way on this and I want to Give a big thanks to Neha for managing this process on the hindsight. Um, 
My name is Chris Roth. I'm a managing director with Heinz, and I've been overseeing the asset and portfolio management of the Hudson Square uh, joint venture for a number of years now. Um, and I also want to say thanks uh, for all the tremendous work to our partners at Future Green, Kassir, The Bid, Philip B, Langan, and the list goes on. Um, high level, I first met with the Department of Transportation to discuss this project in the summer of 2017. Um, I just mentioned that simply because I feel it really highlights the fact that, as Neha said, we really consider ourselves a long-term steward of this neighborhood. Uh, this catch stretch of King Street between Greenwich and Hudson really jumped out to us immediately on this assignment in 2016 as an opportunity for enhancing the public streetscape of the neighborhood. Um, you know, Dan, we can jump to the next slide. Thank you. Um, and really fast forwarding to today, King Street continues to be deeply aligned with our sort of community-based efforts uh, to date. You know, for starters, we've deployed numerous public art installations across the portfolio, helping to further create a sense of place and identity. We've introduced and continue to bring very unique and diverse uh, small business and local uh, retailer offerings to the neighborhood, which really have added new life and activity to the street. Um, and as demonstrated a few weeks ago with the painting of the 35 UPS gates on Greenwich, um, we've executed a number of successful and heavily attended volunteering efforts uh, where we and our tenants have given back and taken care of the neighborhood. And, you know, specifically, I wanted to highlight with regards to King Street, you know, we've partnered with the bid and pop up New York uh, on a number of occasions. Uh, on temporarily closing this stretch of street and hosting uh, pretty large scale successful outdoor markets, clocking in excess of well over 5,000 daily attendees. Um, so as everyone here is, is well aware, we've still got a long way to go on executing this project, given the various agency approvals required uh, moving forward. Uh, but I just wanted to close in saying thank you to the members of the community board for letting our team present to you today. Uh, and continue to progress this project uh, and take the appropriate next steps towards a successful execution. Uh, and I'll hand it back to Neha. Thanks, Chris. Um, you know, as as everyone can see from this, you know, we're really taking a holistic approach in our placemaking efforts at Hudson Square. This is an integral piece of it. Um, you know, in, in conjunction with a lot of the the art improvements and, and the retail upgrades that we're going to be doing. I hope that the constituents here start seeing um, some of our hard work that we've undertaken over the past two years um, come to life as um, a lot of these retailers that we've talked about are starting to open their doors to the public, you know, call it starting spring next year through winter of next year and beyond. And so hopefully you will start seeing the, the fruits of our labor on all fronts. And, um, you know, for anyone who's interested, we'd love, love for you to reach out and participate in some of our other efforts um, if they interest you. I think I can hand it back to Shirley to open it up for Q&A. Uh, Samara, yeah. Samara, I think is now elevated. If you want to unmute Samara, try it now. Oh, and, and she has her hand raised. Yes, I'm miraculously unmuted. Shout out to Carson in my office for suggesting I raise my hand. Um, thanks, guys. I just I just wanted to quickly say everything that Neha and Chris just outlined. Um, we are true partners in this. We are dedicated to maintaining the corridor and making sure that it's as beautiful as Hudson Street is, which hopefully everyone on this committee has seen. Um, and also, I just want to say we really appreciate the support of this committee in general as we make our neighborhood for people. And Heinz has been a really big part of that. I hope you guys have seen the UPS gaze. There's a lot more of that that we're all hoping to do together. And uh, Corey and I are here. I think maybe if Corey raises his hand, he could say that too. But we have really already discussed how we will make sure to maintain this and make sure it looks as beautiful as you see here in the renderings. And we have we have a joke in our office that we turn renderings into reality. Um, and we really expect that to be the case here too. Thank you, Samara. Uh First, we will hear any questions from the committee, and I see Dan first, and Frederick, or after the committee, as a board member, you come next. Yeah, I, I live in the neighborhood. I'm also CB2's representative to Hunt Square Bid, so I do the great work that I, I know the great work they did. This is the first time I'm actually seeing King Street, and it's just so that everybody understands this is not a thorough street. This is like a street that's very rarely used, there's not a lot of car traffic. We do lose parking, but um, in, in your study in doing this, did how did how did losing the parking come up? Was it just what is the parking regulations on that block? So the, this block primarily has press parking, and actually, as part of the DOT review, we have to preserve those parking spots. 
So there is um, a certain amount of parking lane that was preserved that you'll see on the plan um, shown there. And, and we didn't really touch that. It might've moved a little bit, you know, left or right, but the, the stretch of parking was left untouched. And the way we were able to achieve the, the area that we need for landscaping was really through the bump outs, which required extensive studies with the, the truck turning radiuses. As you can imagine, we have some pretty big trucks, you know, turning in and out uh, along Greenwich and um, uh, onto Hudson Street. And so to make sure that, you know, that was possible, we um, had to realign the curbs um, more times than we'd like to admit to, to make it work. Great, and I think it's a wonderful addition to a neighborhood. And I love the the touch of the the bench, which is you know, which gives it historical relevance. I think it's uh, wonderful. Thank you for presenting okay. it to us. So, uh, anyone else on the committee? I think not. I don't see any other hands. So, Frederica, it's yours. Thank you. Um, it you you are doing beautiful work, and uh, I thought it was funny when you said you turned renderings into reality. So when I saw the two mature trees on the right hand uh, part of the slide. I wondered, is that, are those tree pits or are those planters? And if they're in, and what's the size of them? Because those are, those are supporting very mature trees. Well, I believe those are pits, but I'm going to let, those are street trees. And they're already there is what you're saying. They're, those are already there. There's two street th trees and then we're, let's see, there's, three street trees and there's when, a okay, my, I guess my question is when you add the trees what is the provision are they planters are they tree pits and what so, are the what so are the dimensions you're adding one street tree um which is on the southwest corner of the plan and uh -huh. that will be um you know um a pit and then the rest will be in planters primarily because of the utility offsets so oh. what's the size of the of the planters. So the, Not, those two, those two, jump in there. those are, yeah, I understand those are already street trees, but when you're adding other trees. Right. Yeah. So, so those two trees are the two existing pear trees, which have mm -hmm. small kind of DO, or DOT standard tree pits. I think they're about four by six around them. And so we're, what we're doing is something you see along Hudson street where they're actually creating much larger planting spaces around these trees in more of like a forest condition that is a much better environment for the trees to grow and mature and creates a, creates a nice understory planting at the base. And we're also incorporating these low fences around to kind of keep dogs out and keep the plantings looking good. So what, what you see across the street is some of the larger planting areas given some of the electric lines and utilities and con ed vaults, we weren't able to create as many at grade tree conditions as possible as we had wanted to. So mm -hmm. a lot of the trees are in these really generous size planters that meet the kind of um, PDC recommendations for, um, for street. Um, generally, I think they're about 16, um, square feet a minimum and then at the far edge the southwestern corner of the street there is a quite large planting bed that houses the one one spot where we're able to include a new street tree um if i just want to chime in um this is in line with the hudson square standard and we've planted or retrofitted more than 500 of these throughout the neighborhood um, and our, our data analysis is already showing they're growing faster than your average New York City street tree and bigger because what you see here too are the permeable pavers. Like you've got the big planter, but then underneath the, the pavers actually absorb more water. And that's great in terms of climate change and environment and dealing with flooding. It also enables the trees to speak underground so that they grow bigger and hardier and healthier. Um, so, you know, we love seeing more of these designs and, you know, we love seeing it on King Street and we hope that this is something we see more and more around the city because we're seeing it's really successful and makes a huge difference in terms of how you feel walking around the neighborhood and the green canopy and the temperature even is lower in the summer. Very exciting. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, then I think that um, that's, that's about the community board and the committee. And now I've got a lot of questions. 
So uh, to start with, I'm curious as to how many parking spaces are there? I believe it's 120 feet. So I, I'll have to go back and get back to you on that, Shirley, to oh, confirm okay. the exact number of press parking. Press. I think it, you said that it was the same amount of parking as there was before, right? Yeah, we have, we've left it unchanged, but I, I'll have to confirm the exact count with you. Oh, okay, I'd, I'd be curious. Yeah, and I, I can then share it with the committee. And yeah, I believe uh, it's about seven seven spots. I think there's five press spots and two other spots on the um, northwest corner. Oh, okay, okay. So, and the other thing was um, the other thing. Like, I have quite a few things. Uh, the, the the street lights. Somewhere it had said that. Um, the existing street lights were lo relocated. And I just wondered what kind of street lights are, are they historical? Are they Cobra? Which type are you using? Is it something new? It's a standard DOT street light. So that would be the Cobra, probably, right? You That's know? correct. Yeah. So there, there was one existing okay. street light that actually got changed with the addition of 555 Greenwich that oh. DOT wanted to relocate across the street. So that's the, that's the one one addition yeah. to meet, oh. meet the light levels. Curious, yeah. Of course, historical street lights you always love, but you know, couldn't get them, okay. Uh, another question, accessoride. I was really surprised about that because I always think of accessoride as kind of a, a different type of environment. So can you just, describe what it actually will be and how it will be used and so on? Sure, so there is an existing accessoride stop on the that southeast corner of the street. It's, it's oh. currently a glass kind of bus shelter with a bench in it. So we're actually just relocating that to the edge of the street with the, with the shift of the curb edge. Oh. So, so it will look kind of like a, a bus shelter then. Right. Yeah, yeah. So it's essentially like a bus shelter, a covered, covered bench for about four people. Um, and that, that was important to us that we kept that and maintained the accessible route. Right. And, and so I'm curious, so, but, but who, access, who accesses the ride and where to usually? The commuters? That's, that's a good question. It's mostly, it's for the public. It's an ADA requirement. And so it's, it's an underutilized stop. However, you know, we want to maintain access. And so, you know, we would obviously keep that on the street for people who would need that service. Um, but it's a pretty quiet, um, in terms of count, it's a pretty quiet stop. Right. Okay, thank you. And uh, I asked about street lighting. Oh, and another thing, it seemed from the plan, there were many more benches on the north side than the south side. And was there a reason for that? We look, am so I wrong? <laughs> the sidewalk on the north side is, is much deeper and, and there's there's a lot more, I guess, canvas to play with there. Um, Max, I can let you chime in if you have any other um, comments on that. Yeah, no, I, th I think that's accurate. We really tried to utilize as much of the space as possible. And the stretch in the center on the south was really limited by the loading mm -hmm. loading docks and a lot of the con ed vaults. So that really limited the amount of benches and seating area that we could include mm -hmm. there. So we we're trying to kind of highlight that zone with artwork along the loading docks to activate it, which uh -huh. doesn't really represent a lush lush pocket on the plan, but I think it was kind of the best we could do with the space and limitations. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and it's it's much narrower on, on the south side, I guess. So there's there's more room, right? Yep, it's half half as wide. Okay, half as wide. Wow. Okay. And um oh the tree benches. Can you describe that? Uh how it might look. I, I wish you had a picture of it. When you say the tree benches. Yeah, it was that what you said. Okay. Yeah, oh, so I think there's a few different seating types. A lot of them are pulled directly from what you're seeing already on the, the bed. So there's yeah. these large the kind of metal, yeah. metal planters, some that have benches that actually wrap them and have a back 
on them, creating a, a comfortable spot to sit directly adjacent to the trees. So you could sit sit in the shade under canopy and kind of get get really up up nice and close to the plantings without um, damaging them. Okay, and but you could see them that. in like the background of this view, probably best, or in um, that axonometric view that we had up earlier. If you, oh, okay. can, if you flip to the appendix, there should be, um, let me make sure that there is. Okay. So in other words, I actually do surround the tree and then use the tree sort of as the back to, as the back to lean against, right? Yeah, the, the planter is taller um, than the seat height so that you actually lean kind of up against the planter and the tree is above you. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I believe there might be some images in here. If sure, not, you I can see in the background. You, you know, I don't have the detail for the bench, Shirley, but we did talk about this. We talked about seat backs in our prior discussion. Right. Exactly. Um, and I can send you just uh, the spec for it, but it essentially is if you walk um, in front of, you know, just the, the bid improvements, like in front of 345 Hudson, what you see there is essentially the, the, the type of bench that we're installing. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and I do see the, the regular wooden benches with backs on this perspective. Okay, and the last question is, when do you anticipate this to be completed? So that's a great question. And, you know, we're, you know, as Chris mentioned, it's been in process for a long time, and, and we've made a lot of progress. Um, we do need to, um, you know, with your support, we need to um, next take on um, PDC. They've completed their concept review, and we've gotten sign off on pretty much everything, including the stone platforms here, which which was a great win for us to, to keep those mm -hmm. on site. Um, and so we're hoping to go to PDC in December, if possible. Uh, uh, sorry, in January, if possible. So we'll submit materials the next week or two, um, and then um, you know, depending on if DOT gives us you know the stamp of approval early next year, we'd like to get this underway as soon as possible. Now, in terms of the timeline to complete the project, this is a, it's a quick project, you know, it, it's not going to be time invasive. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be terribly noisy or inconvenient. Um, you know, we're saying, you know, one to two months maximum for, for actually um, doing the, the roads, roadside work. There's no utility work that's being done. Um, so it's just, the street's not going to be dug up forever, right? It, it's hopefully it'll be a 30 day project. However, you know, in terms of the bench installations, the benches are all subject to revocable consents. So I do want to emphasize that this project is going to have to be phased just for the purpose of trying to get something done. Um, in the initial phase, it will be the, the expanded curbs, the pavers, and the, the, the landscaping, depending on season. And then the second phase will be the benches when the revocable consents are, are approved. So we are going through that process in tandem with DOT to really um, make sure that they identify all the items that they need to approve as part of the RC. And anything that falls into that bucket has to be a day two installation. Um, so unfortunately, it cannot all be done at once um, unless we just wait, pushed everything out, you know, which, you know, we don't Understood. like to at least start some of the improvements so that people can use, so the landscaping can grow in and, and people can start to enjoy it. So in other words, you'll start landscaping and that'll at least be starting giving the public a nice head start. Exactly. So, I mean, if we can really push this forward in Q1, ideally we would be able to do this, um, we call it late spring, because that's really the ideal landscaping window. And, and Max can speak, you know, um, more to that. But there, there's a couple of windows with spring being really the ideal window to, to, to do the plantings. Um, and then hopefully things will sort of fill out. And then in the next season, we can come in and, and do the benches. Yeah. So what would you say? 2024 would be the, the final completion, point? likely 2024. Correct. Okay. And but we're, we're hoping that you'll start seeing changes with the landscaping and the art and the curb expansion in the meantime. Right. -o. Okay. And I see that Janet has a question too. Janet? Thank you. I, I'm just curious. Uh, I think this is a lovely prototype for, a, you know, a nice, quiet side street. And uh, you may not want to share this with us, but I'm curious, it, you know, and it, it, it's not a large scale project, obviously, if it's going to take, I mean, the planning's taken forever, but the installation 30 days. 
would you would you be willing to tell us what this is what this costs uh, our current budget is between one and two million dollars okay um okay um thank you okay so i really think that's it except that i did we did receive one letter from a constituent all very positive and supportive and i just like to read you a few segments of it. Uh, she says that she's a neighborhood resident and the president of the Van Damme Street Block Association. And she's writing in support. And she's saying that really much is going to give much needed greener, greenery and outdoor seating to the neighborhood. And it's really welcome. And that the planners here have been diligent in reaching out to the residents of the neighborhood. Uh, plan was presented to residents of King Street, Trotton, and Van Damme. At the three blocks comprising the historic district. And um, they were really gratified that they were included because they're often overlooked. Uh, so all very positive. And uh, they, she says that they also addressed their concerns about traffic flow, sanitation, and security. So they are totally in support. And Thank you, Shirley. It sounds like Jeff Jeff has raised his hand. Jeff uh, Rowland has raised his hand from the attendance. Oh, okay, so now we have to go to the public. Yes. So, Dan, you just call on whoever. Yeah, that'd office. be Jeffrey. Jeffrey, uh, let me go ahead and open you up. Uh, my attendees, which looks like they have somewhere. Okay. Am I the only host on this right now? Let's see. Oops. Just oh. There we go, Jeffrey. Gotta find you. There you go. Let's see if you can talk now. There we go. Oh yeah, we hear you, you, Jeffrey. Hey, hi. Um, I waited through that whole 14th Street uh, bid one just to get to this project because I really love this. My only concern and my what I would encourage them to do is they haven't used enough of the north side of the street. They need to use more of that sidewalk. Um, it's very wide. They need to expand their vision. It is beautiful otherwise, and uh, by and large, the, the improvements in that area have been excellent for benches and seating and trees. But this particular one, I just wanna see them use more of that very wide sidewalk uh, for making a park-like uh, continuum. Uh, rather than a linear straight sidewalk and using the fill-ins of the roadbeds, I would like them to invade into the sidewalk a bit. Uh, other than that, I, I can't wait. And thank you for adding it. I consider this my neighborhood because I was over there just yesterday. I have to walk over to the post office and, and I'm by King. I, I'm a, a block away and I walk down to, uh, to Hudson and then I turned and walked down Hudson. So I know that area well. And I'd like to see money improvements like this and this one i'd like to see expanded thank you okay thanks jeffrey um is there anyone else then or shall we be going into our business session sure. oh Mia, did you want to say something well surely do we do you want us to respond to that or or should we just... oh if, if you'd like to sure yeah, yeah I'll, I'll very very quickly uh jeff we would like to expand it as well and frankly this plan was uh, was much larger in the past. And unfortunately, given a lot of the infrastructure constraints and requirements of the Department of Transportation, what you see is the max that we are capable of executing. Um, so just just kind of is what it is, given um, given the landscape that we're working with. I, I'll add to that, Jeff. Um, the, the north side of the street has a 15 foot band that surrounds it, which is um, pop space, um, publicly pri publicly operated private space or privately operated public space, um, which essentially is we can't touch um, in terms of modifying it. And so we really had to leave that untouched because you can't any anything permanent that's put in that 15 foot band um, it is pr practically impossible to 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 do or to accomplish. And so we had to leave that, and which is why we had to do the bump outs to give us the room to leave egress and then also have create canvas for the, the, the plantings. I would like to say though, that what we've presented here is, is really um, the scope that requires um, uh, PDC approval, but we 
On top of that, we're able to do planters that just sit on the ground, which don't require any approvals along the pop space. You know, anything temporary is possible to put in that space. Um, so we do have in our, you know, in our in our fuller, I guess, grand plan, we have additional planters and sort of um, greenery that bracket the other side of the building so that you have more of this like greenway that you're walking through, which isn't shown here because it's not in the scope of what the PDC is approving. But I think for everyone to realize that there, you know, there's an ability to at least make it feel greener without actually putting it in, a, in the ground. Thank you have you. another speaker, Kristen Martin. Ms. Malavita. Hi. Hi, all. Um, happy to be here. I'm the artistic director of Here Art Center. We've been in the neighborhood for 30 years and have just really been uh, very pleased by the way that Heinz and the bid working together have cared for our neighborhood and progressed our neighborhood to a space that's much more welcoming. And I think this project is just an incredible example of how we can transform the neighborhood in ways that make it more livable and more of a space that people will inhabit at all different times of day. And as an organization that works in the day and in the evening, both with our gallery open during the day and uh, theater and music and art activities in the night, like it's really wonderful to feel the neighborhood going in this direction. So I'm just expressing my support. Okay, thank you, Kristen. Anyone else from the public then? Uh, let's see. Uh, anybody else have their hands up? Let's see. I don't think so. I'm gonna. Yeah. I see no no hands. No, nope. that's it. I guess we're ready for. Uh... Finally, ready for our business session, and um, everybody is welcome to stick around of our guests. But uh, we're the only ones that talk right now, uh, so. Please, please stick, stick around and hear what we have to say. And with that, I think we should go right away back to um, the Meatpacking Bids presentation on the uh, the Western plan, the Western side plan. So uh, first of all, I guess I'd like to know how folks feel about doing the resolution. And would you rather do a resolution or could we just do some notes? Because I sure will have plenty of notes uh, to make commentary on. Uh, so kind of it's up to the committee to decide if we want to actually ask for more things or just to really uh, maybe do a short resolution. And we're looking forward to the next um, uh, presentations and the next phases of the project. So Dan is first, so. Yeah, I, I agree. I don't think that this uh, would make sense to write a resolution right now, other than uh, we look forward to hearing continued progress in that. It was just it was like part of it was a pipe dream and a fairy tale to me. Um, that's why uh, I don't want to, we shouldn't spend too much time on even going over the details, details other than being generic and saying, the plan makes sense, but it lacks a lot of details. You know, uh, Donna brought up some good points about traffic. Um, I don't think all of that can be discussed in one meeting, right? So we have to hear multiples. And, and there is a holistic approach there, but uh, I think that it needs far more discussion. So a letter or a note, I mean, it's not a letter. I mean, just uh, notes, I think, would be exactly right. Okay. Uh, and how about you, Richard? Do you think? We should go so, for <clears throat> I don't disagree with Dan. Um, um, I would just like to express support for uh, the first step of many um, that is try to present an overarching vision for the area. That was one of the criticisms of the last meeting that we had with the meatpacking bid. And they came back to us with a larger vision. And now... Um, you know what I would hate to see them being attacked for for not being uh, immensely detailed when um, what they really you know what we asked them to do was to look at the entire area and this is a kind of um, would love to have something along these lines with greater input from all stakeholders and so I I think whatever we put out there I would like to express our support that they continue this work because it can only add um, benefits to the neighborhood. Okay, and Janet. 
Oh, I'll just second that. Maybe um, if we want to take a vote on that, but I, I agree uh, to give our support. As Jeffrey said, it will also help him advance it if DOT hears that from us. Like a short kind of resolution, maybe enumerating a few of the things they presented, but really short. And then just... Uh, an encouragement to please continue on. And we're looking forward to the next thing. And yes. Everybody in agreement to that? I got to see hands. Let's hit, hit your raise yes. hand. Okay. Oh, raise Anybody? a hand or, or press the hand. Well, press the hand press in. Okay, so we got a unanimous. Okay, so that's okay. fine. Uh, Good. Unanimous and support. And I will try, I'll do a draft of a real short one. And um, you'll tell me if you want to add anything else. And that's fine. Good. Okay. And how about King Street now? Nice. So, read to King Street. Yeah, read to oh I just wanted to express support, that's all. Okay. I support it too. It's wonderful. Yeah. Okay, Dan, did you want to say yeah, something? Yeah, I mean that's it. We yeah, go through the details. We support pretty much all aspects of it. Just makes our neighborhood nicer. And yeah. it's uh, it's quick and it's, I'd imagine that the neighborhood. they put a lot I mean, of great amenities. A lot, they put a lot of resources in it already, which is why it's going to be so quick to turn it around. So. Yes, that's true. Yeah. Is, is it possible to say anything that, like, I don't know if there's a way to say, like, we're sorry it took so long? Like, why the hell? They've been working on it since 2017. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we applaud it. And I don't maybe, know. I don't know. Maybe if, I'll try to figure out something in a subtle way in the draft, and then you can. And, right. Okay, better, what I thought better. I probably will do with this one then in the draft is I will enumerate some of those improvements and um, then our support. And I think good. Uh, anybody else want to say anything? Yeah, Any I just have a, yeah, Aaron? A, thanks. Just a couple comments. I mean, a theme of what we've seen tonight is, you know, substantial improvement to public space and better allocation of public space. Um, but, you know, we, we're also hearing a lot about costs and how this is not always feasible or achievable. So kind of similar to what was just said, I think, you know, maybe we can, in this resolution, solicit not just input on why it has taken so long, but specifically, what are the cost drivers that have, you know, made this $2 million for a, a single city block? Um, and to the end goal of trying to design sort of a, a playbook or a scalable process that can, you know, extend other city blocks at a cost lower than $2 million, right? So if we can start to understand the drivers of cost, then we can eventually, you know, as a city, as a community board, we can try to scale this type of improvement okay. uh, elsewhere. Adam, if you want to say something like that, please give me the wording. I, I'm not I will. sure I agree uh, from my point of view. Um, and that's almost like a whole different, just give me the verbiage and then I can send it to the committee and, and, and okay. comment on it. Um, this is kind of like a, a, a sort of short term Kind of project, very limited in its the area and, and scope. And um, if you can put it into some simple words, I think maybe we can do it. the same for what you said, Janet. And I, you know, that's my opinion. Can I solicit other people to say something about those concepts? I mean, obviously, it should have not taken that long. Every DOT thing takes inordinately longer than it should and um uh, so, so do we take this one out and say 
you know, it's a shame that it took so long. Well, I don't know. Uh, thanks for your perseverance. You know, keep it positive. Yeah, maybe that's right. Keep, keep it positive. Uh -huh. Don't shame them. Well, we're not upset with the, the developer. Our, our distress is that working with the city just takes so damn long. I'm sure they wanted to move. I'm sure that they moved as quickly as they could. Okay, move. you give me some verbiage on that and I'll stick it in, okay? But certainly to say that we really respect them for their perseverance in, in terms of good for the community. Okay. Right. I think that's it. Okay. And thank you all, uh, and um, see you at the full board, which is on the 20th. Okay, night now. All right, thank you. Thank Take you. care, everybody. Thank, thank you. you.